Yes. So I'm going to call the meeting to order for the afternoon of April 13th. And uh, if everyone who is able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Funny. I need to call roll. Yes. Thank you. Jimenez? Present. Prowlis? Here. Cohen? Here. Carrasco? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? You have a quorum. All I'm right. Here. I'm here, Tony. Thank you. Today's invocation will be provided by Iman Tamar Amwar with the South Bay Islamic Association. And Council Member Cohen will tell us more. Um, okay, well, actually, we're a week off. You're a week off. This week's invocation will be by Andrew Hung from the Reyesa Chinese School. I thank Andrew for being patient uh, with us in our late start today. Um, I also do have a brief tribute here to uh, Mr. Shark, and I wore my Shark's jersey in recognition, but just wanted to uh, mention that. But thank you, Andrew, for being with us. Uh, one of the gems of District 4 is the Reyesa Chinese School which uh, operates at uh, the three middle schools in the Berryessa School District. Um, at one time, and I think it may still be, it's, it's the largest uh, Chinese school west, in the Western United States, drawing students from all over the Bay Area. And uh, it's entirely volunteer run. It just celebrated its 40th anniversary, founded back in 1980. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't have the celebration this past year, and I hope we'll do that um, the next year when we can get back in person. Um, it's entirely, like I said, entirely volunteer run and they have rotating principals um, who are members of the community there. Uh, I do, as a personal aside, my daughter spent four years studying Mandarin at the Paris uh, Chinese School and it's a really great opportunity for many in our community. Andrew Hung is the current principal and he's here to introduce a brief video of some of their, one of their cultural programs. So I'll let him take it from here. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Ah, uh, you kind of stole my speech already. <laughs> I don't want to run down. It's very similar to what you just said. Okay, well, I'll just do a real quick 
Uh, Honorable Mayor Licardo and Council Member, uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm the current principal and I represent the Berryessa Chinese School. Berryessa Chinese School is located in the Berryessa District of San Jose, District 4. We are a nonprofit community school that runs every Saturday from September to June. And as David says, he's correct. We run entirely by parent volunteer, including himself in the past. Uh, in fact, I think you served it as one of our patrol, I believe. Um, well, your daughter did, did attend our CFL program, and uh, that was great. Thank you. And we were here uh, established in 1980. Uh, we've been here for 41 years, and we've been providing the good, great, I think really good environment for learning about Chinese language and its culture. We are unique in that we have a dual track program. We offer both Mandarin and Cantonese class from pre-K to 12th grade. And we also have 20 culture classes, including abacus, Chinese painting, Chinese go, Chinese instrument, flower arrangement, Tai Chi Chung, and of course the ever popular badminton. Since 2008, um, we started CFL program and that's also when David, your daughter joined us. Um, we also have been offering the recently since 2018, a uh, high school integrated Chinese program because we found that there's a need for this for the local high school student. And as, I, as you said last year, we were trying to get ready for our milestone 40 years anniversary. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we had to transition everything to the online classes. We will return to uh, physical learning this fall. And I hope to see you all there and we'll resume the celebration event. Uh, let me show you, let me see if I can share this. Hold on. Okay. Here is a, the cover for our 40th, 40th anniversary and it's done by our student. Actually, we had hosted a contest and the top three winner from our student body actually uh, created these. And the theme for the yearbook for the 40th anniversary was cherishing our heritage. And we also, uh, one of our students also created the logo for us, a commemor commemorative logo using the uh, dragon, of course, as a symbol for longevity. And let me go to, uh, Okay, let me see, so let me switch over. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> let me switch over to that, otherwise you can't see it. Okay. And here's our music group, which has been performing all around in the local Bay Area, led by our teacher, Anita. And we're gonna be playing a song that we have used it many, many times in the past called, let's see, The General's Command, Zheng Guan Ling, okay? And thank you very much we'll, for this uh, invitation here. Here we go. Henry, do you have to share to get the sound or? Yeah, I'm happy to share it with sound so we can hear it.
All right. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Wasn't sure if I was playing correctly. Okay. Well, thank you, Andrew, for being with us today and for representing the various Chinese school. Thank you, David. Yes. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you, Councilmember Cohen, to, uh, for also your flexibility. Now, I'm on the, the right date and the right uh, script now, so thank you for that pivot. Um, next is orders of the day. Uh, does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? If not, um, there really isn't a need for a motion on orders of the day, so we're going to move to uh, close this closed session report. Nora. Um, thank you. The only thing we have to report will be heard um, on the open session with respect to the amicus brief. So we'll have the, that handled in that fashion. And otherwise, there was nothing to report out. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the consent calendar. Are there any items that the council wants to pull from the consent calendar? I see Council Member Arenas would like to pull 2.11 and Council Member Carrasco uh, would like to pull item 2.12. Are there any other items that uh, my colleagues would like to, pu to pull? If not, um, Council Member Arenas, um, approval of the National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Thank you, yeah. Vice Mayor. Um, and, and thank you to all of you who are sharing this beautiful Zoom background to recognize April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. The blue pinwheels in our background are from the National Foundation to End Child Abuse and Neglect and serve um, as a campaign and as a reminder that we all play a role in children's lives, either as parents, aunts, uncles, uh, teachers, and neighbors. Uh, this year, the National Child Abuse Prevention Month theme selected by the Children's Bureau is Thriving Children and Families, Prevention with Purpose, um, so appropriate. And, and this is really to recognize and promote uh, positive child and family well-being. Um, as you all know, due to the pandemic, parents and caregivers have been confronted with just extraordinary challenges that um, created a, a tremendous amount of stress in our homes, including uh, decreased wages or loss of work, lack of adequate child care, uh, distance learning, housing instability, so many things that our families have had to deal with just in the short span of time of one year. And all of these hardships can really compound the day-to-day -day stress of raising children. Um, I can attest to that as a mom of a six-year-old and a 12-year-old with distance learning at home. Um, and throughout this pandemic, there is an increase in concern about unreported cases of child abuse. And it is more important, uh, more now than ever, to support our children as they prepare to return to in-person learning. Um, and we all know that our schools and our teachers and faculty all represent a real safe space for our children and experts um, expect a delayed reporting of child abuse as we return to in-person learning. Um, and we know that exposure to violence at a young age can heighten the risk for health issues later on, such as alcoholism, drug abuse, addiction, smoking, mental health uh, disorders, and criminal behavior. Um, and as uh, policymakers and part of this community, we can help bear some of the stress children and families are feeling due to the impact and losses uh, that they have enduring, endured during this pandemic, uh, because the mental health and well-being of children and families is a social responsibility. And um, for all forms of government, not just for the county, um, so I, I include our, our city as being part of those that are responsible. Today, I am honored to recognize and partner with the Children's Advocacy, Advocacy Center of Santa Clara County 
and to proclaim April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. And they just opened up their doors uh, yesterday. And I'm smiling ear to ear because this is an integrated resource model to provide true, just very true wraparound services that prevents child abuse survivors from having to relive trauma by coordinating forensic exams, interviews, referrals, um, to mental health services, appointments with our own police, forensic investigators and advocates, and they're all under one roof. And so this advocacy center um, is a, a partnership, a true partnership with um, the Children's Advocacy Center Medical Clinic, the DA's office, uh, of course, our own San Jose Police Department, which I'm so proud of, and uh, YWCA, Golden State of Silicon Valley and Community Solutions. And it's expected to serve more than 300 children and families in its first year. And according to the National Children's Alliance, a lot of the children advocacy centers serve far more sexual abuse cases, indicating a deeper problem. Um, in that area. And so I want to thank uh, Supervisor Cindy Chavez and Susan Ellenberg, who have been um, advocating for this uh, advocacy center for a really long time through our joint meetings, um, especially Dr. Uh, Jeff Smith for his leadership as well. Um, and so today we have with us, um, I believe, Dr. Sturm and Jennifer Pethoff, and she's uh, leading our advocacy center. I'm hoping that we can see a video uh, to introduce us to this wonderful uh, celebration of this advocacy center. And um, before I do that, I also want to recognize District Attorney Jeff Rosen from our District Attorney's Office, Daniel Little, Director of Department of Family Children and Services, Dr. Marlene Sturm, um, who's our medical director, Children's Advocacy Center of Santa Clara County, and just been amazing. Of course, also with Mary Ritter, who's a physician assistant pediatric um, safe examiner. Uh, of course, Jennifer Puttoff, who's a program manager uh, for the Advocacy Center, and our very own San Jose Police Department Sexual Assaults Investigative Unit, who will be co-located at this um, Advocacy Center. And like I said, YWCA and Community Solutions. Henry, if you could please play that video, would be wonderful. Gloria lives in Gilroy, Way is in San Jose. Pedro is from Palo Alto. All three are victims of child abuse. They need a comforting counselor, a friendly police officer, and compassionate medical care all in one safe location where they will be listened to and cared for. They need the Children's Advocacy Center of Santa Clara County. In the past, victims of abuse and their families had to navigate services in multiple locations throughout the county, each trip adding to the mileage, the trauma, confusion, and frustration. Today, we are so proud to show you the place we have created for them. I'm Casey Halkin, Director of District Attorney Victim Services, along with Percy, our court support dog, here to welcome you to the Children's Advocacy Center, where these once widespread services are now together under one roof. Welcome to the Children's Advocacy Center. Come on in. The District Attorney's Office, in partnership with the County Board of Supervisors and Santa Clara County Valley Medical Center, is bringing a national model of excellence to children in our communities. The CAC is staffed by a team of highly trained and compassionate specialists who are here to help every child and family who walks through our door whenever they need us. Thank you. Sorry, I just realized that. Uh, thank you so much, Vice Mayor. And I just was wondering if we could allow uh, Jennifer, who's uh, the program manager for the Advocacy Center, to also say a few words. They've been waiting for us since our closed session uh, ran a little long. Definitely. Henry, can you uh, move her up? Go, yes, go ahead, Jennifer. Hi. Well, good afternoon. Can you hear me OK? Perfectly. Wonderful. Well, thank you members of City Council and Council Member Aranis for recognizing April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. My name is Jennifer Putoff and I am the program manager for the Children's Advocacy Center of Santa Clara County, a program of the District Attorney's Office. We are honored to be a community partner supporting the proclamation today 
At the Children's Advocacy Center of Santa Clara County, we provide expert and compassionate care for youth who have experienced sexual abuse, assault, physical abuse, and neglect. Our team of trained professionals coordinate the investigation, prosecution, and the critical support services needed for children and families to begin their healing process. For every child who discloses abuse, we know that nine other children are still suffering in silence. This month and throughout the year, we encourage all community members to use your voice and speak up for children who cannot speak for themselves. Child maltreatment is a preventable problem, and each of us has an obligation and an opportunity to break the cycle of child abuse and neglect. It is important for our community members to recognize the signs of abuse. Reporting any concern could help protect a child and connect a family with the help that they need. April is also really a time of reflection and a moment for recognition. We recognize our youngest survivors and we rededicate ourselves to their protection. We also acknowledge the professionals who spend their lives helping vulnerable youth and we thank them for their vital work throughout the year. All adults play a role in creating caring connections and nurturing environments for the healthy development of our future generation of parents, leaders, and community members. I would like to express my sincere thanks to the council for valuing our youth and for your efforts towards making sure that every child in San Jose has an opportunity for a happy, healthy, and thriving life. Thank you all so much for having us here today. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we're gonna go back to council. Um, Councilman Moranis, or... I think Jennifer did a good job in just closing that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Awesome, awesome. Uh, now we're going to go to item 2.12. Um, Council Member Carrasco. Thank you. Well, I want to first of all thank uh, Council Member Arenas. Uh, uh, that was a beautiful proclamation. And of course, I worked in foster care. And so, uh, so uh, that proclamation is uh, near and dear to my heart. So thank you so much, Council Member Arenas, for, for doing that. So uh, on to uh, Earth Day. Uh, this Thursday, April 22nd, marks the 51st anniversary of Earth Day as a national holiday. And of course, with increasing numbers of alarming and quite frightening uh, natural disasters exasperated by undoubtedly global warming, such as last year's wildfires that pillaged California. It must be repeated over and over that every single day must be treated like Earth Day. Small actions taken every single day by every individual, such as recycling, composting, uh, buying even secondhand clothing, which my children love to do now, uh, and avoiding single-use uh, plastic bags, which I admittedly must do more often, are great ways to really do our part in saving Mother Earth. I'm proud to be part of a city that supported the aggressive goals of the Paris Agreement, even when the federal administration decided to pull out the city of San Jose said, no, 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 we're going to do our part and continue to move forward and stood strong in making sure that, uh, that we were part of a global community and, and understood that the global community depended on collective action. As a result, the city of San Jose has taken a strong initiative to promote progressive environmentalism. And within our city framework, uh, we, uh, have, have been very loud and clear that through the Climate Smart San Jose plan, it outlines the city's plan in addressing ever alarming climate change. And its purpose is to decrease greenhouse gas emissions and unnecessary water and resource consumption. Additionally, our city's environmental services makes it even easier for residents to do their part by providing a wide variety of services, including free junk pickup and responding to incidents of illegal dumping, which are free to residents throughout the city of San Jose. This keeps our environment clean, as well as our streets, 
and of course our community our community safe. I want to thank uh, the residents of District 5 and my team. This last weekend, uh, we did our part in uh, in in uh, in, in uh, participating in uh, in our uh, what is it our uh, uh, our our litter pickup. I know that it was canceled for most of the city, but we did our great litter pickup day. Councilmember Perales, we missed the competitive nature of your team, but uh, we look forward to it next year to beat you again. Uh, I'm still waiting for my trophy. I don't know what happened to it. I know that you got it last time. I want it back on my shelf. So anyway, we picked up two tons of litter uh, with uh, quite a team of volunteers throughout the district. They were excited. They wanted to keep going in spite of the pandemic. We we did a lot of uh, effort to make sure that we we dis we safely distanced, uh, but boy, they were out there with their litter pickup sticks and a lot of bags. And uh, of course, I want to thank also Paul Pareda. Uh, you all know that. Uh, uh, I guess he works for the mayor, but you know we all pick him up as our our part of our extended family. So thank you, Paul, for making sure that uh, our district was uh, clean and uh, and of course uh, we continued our tradition. So again, happy Earth Day. Uh, let's do our part and make sure that we continue to be part of that global community to make sure that our kids have something to look forward to. Thank you so much. Thank you, council member. Um, it actually got me fired up. I think we're going to go for number one next year. So get ready. I know. Get ready. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go to public comments. Uh, Tessa. Unmute. Okay, you can hear me, right? Loud and clear. All right, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate this time to talk. Um, we got a very bad notice from our um, uh, church. What's he, he called? He's the uh, general, the secretary general of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. And he said today that we have three crises, and they are climate change. Biologi uh, biological diversity collapse and pollution. These are the three crises we have, and we need to act very quickly to change that around. And he said that we are on the edge of abyss. The word is abyss. Okay, that's you know we are we're in we are in the sixth great mass extinction, and so uh, the abyss is what is that is where we are in. We're no longer in the jaws of destruction. We are we're falling into the destruction. And it, you know we're bringing six million species along with us. Oh no, it's one million species, one million that are going extinct in the next couple of decades. So the thing is, we need to change radically, and it, it does mean that you know we can't be de doing any more of the zero sum game of the building and developing. And so that's why I've been fighting to fight no hotel because we need to grow food. That's what we need to grow, and we need to think about a a universal basic income that we can have women be the caregivers of the children for at least the first five years. That is the child abuse prevention, that we have the mothers taking care of our children and we need the, the, the universal basic income. And then they need to learn how to grow food and to live without fossil fuels. That is the type of program I wanna see happen in our city is that we, we need to all be growing food and we need to then take that 615 Thank you, Tessa. Avenue. Thank you. Uh, Paul? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I'd like to know, is the amicus brief, because I'm really interested in knowing uh, precisely what the city's position is on that. So that's going to be a separate issue? Paul, uh, please uh, I'm just continue, looking for your, yes, uh, no. please continue your, uh, your public comments. Okay. Okay, um, well, I'm just, well, I'm, I'm trying to, but I'm really concerned about that one. But with respect to what has been done so far, um, thank you for uh, Councilwoman uh, Arenas and uh, uh, Carrasco for putting those two items on the table. Um, yeah, there's 
child abuse, it, it does happen like that. You grow up and you, in order to deal with that pain, you use the drugs or the alcohol, the behavioral problems start surfacing in the third or fourth grade, school to prison pipeline, that, th th this, that's the formula. And so it's not necessarily that, that there's, and, and there's, a, there's, there's social and economic conditions that create that. And, and those are the social and economic conditions that are the generational inheritance of the redlining that happened. I mean, it's very easy. If you talk to a sociologist, you talk to a clinical psychologist, they'll tell you, I've talked to them all my life. And what usually happens is that those dudes, the people that, and the youngsters that get neglected from that child abuse, they end up being my celly. And then I'm sitting there and I'm listening to all of this horror and tragedy and neglect and abuse that they experience within the context of the uh, foster care system. The foster care system in Santa Clara County was feeding them like 20 uh, psych meds. Uh, Karen DeSau for the Mercury News was the one that exposed that. And, and so, so I, I, I appreciate the fact that you are centering that and seeing that the generational consequences that can happen when we as a collective in a city and a society do not pay attention to these kids and, and their safety. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right. Bring it back to the council. Um, can I get a motion and a second on the consent calendar? Motion to approve. Second. second. Awesome. Uh, Tony? Jimenez? Aye. Corrales? Aye. Cohen? Cohen? Crosco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Okay, on to item 10.1, the land use consent calendar. Uh, let me see if we have any public comments, which we don't. So, Ooh. all right. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Tony? Jimenez? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Sorry, absent. Thank you. Okay. On to item 3.1, report of the city manager. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, we have no report today. Thank you. Okay, on to item 3.4, statement of policy and city council questions for the prospective planning, building, and code enforcement department director. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager. Um, the city manager's office um, has developed the statement of policy and questions for the next director of the Department of Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. Um, and we've done this uh, in collaboration with outreach to our development community, our, our residents and community leaders, as well as staff of uh, planning, building and code enforcement. So in the memo, uh, it contains 17 questions that we have come up with. And we would like to get the council's input on that today. I do want to acknowledge um, memoranda from the mayor, council members Perales and Arenas with additional questions to be considered. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna go to the public for public comments. Um, first is Tessa. Yes. Um, our land use is a big issue. And what I'm noticing in our, our community, as I've been dealing with my neighborhood, 615 Stockton Avenue, is planned to be a hotel. And the reason it's being planned to be a hotel is because of these back deals, back backroom deals of corporations running our city. We saw it, we saw it with Mayor Licardo and Deb Davis and all the other ones that signed on to let Bloom, Bloom go forward in the natural gas, you know, as a natural gas exception. That, that was a well-documented um, political um, tragedy that happened in our city. And now we're seeing, I'm seeing it in my neighborhood, the tragedy of where businesses are getting the laws written for our land use so that to protect themselves. So what happened in our situation is that 
the, the new law that came into being that that you have to be a thousand feet from from you know a polluting source and sit and that therefore we could not have affordable housing because it was within a thousand feet because we have central cement down the street and that that stopped the affordable housing that was planned in our neighborhood instead we're getting a hotel only because the city is only allowing that under its its general plan and so what we need is not business friendly we need people friendly we need controls of the business instead of making it so you don't live near the, the polluting you stop the polluting the noise and the air pollution you don't just say that housing can't live here because we're protecting the business this is the this is the tragedy of what happened in my neighborhood is protecting the business and this has been going on because it's the royal coach tours it's the fossil fuels that have been burning the diesel that none of my council members have helped me with none of them starting back with ken yeager or, or pierre luigi or De dev davis we are we are too business friendly and this is where we need to change thank you tessa uh paul go ahead uh yeah yeah thank you vice mayor um the the city is going to be compelled sooner or later to take a formal position on the truth, not opinion, okay? Because if I say something and two other people say something, there is not equal weight. Okay, well, you gave your opinion, you gave your opinion, and you gave your opinion. No, there's, there's something, such a thing as the truth. And when the truth is spoken, that trumps whatever comes out of the other people's mouths, because this is the truth. So I, I'm not going to give weight or merit to somebody that has a dissenting view just simply because they want to dissent. They're dissenting against the truth. Okay, and so the redlining policy that created everything that is actually an extension of the land stealing and the land uh, plunder that happened on July 14th of 1846 right here in this city, it's well documented. The massacres that happened here in San Jose that passed down through generation, created the Willow Glen area, okay? And so this planning commission and the questions that he needs to be asked, I would like, what is his or her opinion of redlining within the context of the planning building and code enforcement? What is your opinion of redlining in this city and its impact on the community? And do you feel that the city should be responsible for rectifying those injustices within the context of his powers within that office. That's what we have to do. We have to have that talk. And there's got to be an, a, a, a city-wide position that is taken in order for us to continue to move on. The other thing is, is that I want them, I want an operating definition of the word equity. This no more, no more uh, subjective definitions. There has to be an objective definition of precisely what that word means. With thank you, Paul. Uh, ben. Uh, thank you, Ben Leach, Executive Director of the Preservation Action Council of San Jose. Um, I wanted to um, echo all of the um, memos that um, extended a note of appreciation for Director Huey's service. Um, we wish her the best in her new role, and we um, have high expectations of her replacement, continuing to be engaging with um, all stakeholders, including um, preservation issues. And on that note, I also want to extend a note of appreciation for um, uh, Council Member Paralysis' memo that um, highlighted the need to address historic preservation as a core um, uh, issue in in um, in this portfolio, um, I think his his recommended question uh, is framed correctly. How can you promote historic preservation in our city while facilitating positive growth and equitable land use planning? Those are not mutually exclusive goals by any means, um, and I think that um, understanding how uh, preservation as public policy can contribute to a more equitable um, city for everybody should be front of mind, um, not only for preservationists, not only for planners, but for the city. The, um, the preservation movement grew out of largely in the 20th century efforts to combat uh, displacement um, and um, uh, you know, 
disproportionate impacts of development on communities that had historically been redlined. So it is in the movement's DNA. That's not to say that we can't do better and shouldn't look at how preservation can be a tool that is available for all of the city um, and not just um, the people who have traditionally um, been interested in it, which is, uh, you know, admittedly just a small portion. So we really look forward to integrating this into the core of the department. Great, thank you. Bring it back to council, uh, council member Arenas. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the comments from our community and and I'm generally supportive. And because of that, I, I thought there were some additional questions and we needed to add. Uh, so I'd like to move my memo um, that asks uh, precisely about some of those redlining um, points that uh, some of the speakers were talking about, um, as well as strategy, strategies to um, implement uh, to address housing segregation and, and the need to balance uh, jobs with the development of San Jose um, while not causing displacement uh, and uh, and also incorporate uh, council member paralysis memo in the motion. All right, we have a motion. Second. second. Okay, we got a second and I Thank don't you. see more Thank hands you. raised. Thank you, Vice Mayor. All right. Wonderful. I'm sorry, Vice Mayor. I, I think I just... You totally, you, hear me you, totally, you totally interrupted my flow, but that's all right. I am. Okay, go with it. I, I was just going to call for a roll call vote. Well, actually, I was hoping there was another memorandum that was submitted, and that was my own. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I, I would request uh, if the maker of the motion would make a, uh, accept a friendly amendment to accept that memorandum as well. So sorry, uh, Mayor. I, I didn't mean to overlook it. I apologize about that. No yes. problem. Absolutely, please. I'd love to include your memo in the motion. And I agree. <laughs> okay, great. Thank All you. Right. Thank Let's... you for allowing me to interrupt the flow. Hey, that, that was important. That was, that was worth it. Got to get your memo in. All right, let's vote. Menes? Aye. Morales? Aye. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Item uh, 4.1 are actions related to the 2020 Internet Crimes Against Children Award. There's no presentation. Are there any comments? We'll first uh, go to the public to see if there's anyone from the public who would like to speak on this item. This is 4.1, actions related to the 2020 Internet Crimes Against Children. This is a grant uh, we routinely receive for our work to address uh, and to proactively uh, investigate. I think our, our San Jose Police Department does an incredible job um, in, in using ICAC awards to prevent a lot of abuse against children. And I'm grateful to the hard work of many of our officers. Uh, okay, Council Member Arenas. Thank you, uh, Mayor. You know, I just really wanted to take an opportunity to highlight some of the work that's being done uh, by the um, Internet Crimes Against Children ICAC uh, unit. Um, and, and to just share, uh, because I sit on uh, the Public Safety Strategic Finance Committee, uh, it's always a mouthful, um, I, 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 I got to hear some of, the, um, some of the work that they did in this past year. And uh, some of it is, is um, very astonishing. And I'm trying to open up that, that report. But from what I can remember uh, from memory, I think it was about a 300 percent increase in that um, in that area and so they have been really busy um, because of course our children are no longer in person um, and uh, learning and um, have switched over to to access their education online and so we just have more kids online is basically what it really comes down to and so they've been really busy um, uh, in supporting our families and our children and with the national um, 
uh, recognition of uh, child abuse. I think this is a very timely. And, um, and so I wanna move the, the memo um, and, uh, and as well as take the opportunity to recognize uh, the work that they're doing. I don't know if there's somebody here. Oh, Lieutenant Anderson. Um, one of just the, one of the items that I was hoping that I could connect with you about is I know that part of this funding, um, uh, I know that we are the fiscal agent for the 11 um, partner um, uh, unit in, in this area. Um, and we provide, and there's training that is part of this budget. And so I was wondering with some of the work that we've been doing in, in our, in the PISFIS and the public safety committee, um, around bringing some awareness of uh, youth stressors to our police officers. I wonder if there's maybe uh, 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 an opportunity to connect both of these units together uh, the, with, the, with the folks who have this expertise in working around children and some of those stressors and maybe the police officers who, who might benefit from, from some of that training, which would make this more, uh, uh, survivor centered and trauma informed. That was most definitely something that we can take a look at. That training is always always valuable, uh, especially for officers when we're um, dealing with and addressing children that have been victims of just you know horrendous crimes. Uh, a lot of this training is uh, very uh, technical and has to do with um, seeking out and finding the evidence that we're looking for in electronic devices. Um, and then we, um, right now are, are really focused on the vigilant parent, but the, this other, uh, stressor training for officers is something that we can obviously take a look at. Um, we just have to be careful that it supports, uh, the ICAC, ICAC mission and, um, supports the 11 counties that, uh, we represent. Uh, I appreciate that. And thank you for bringing up that, um, uh, vigilant parent um, model, which I, from what I understand, is um, gaining a lot of traction and a lot of appreciation from parents that now have children, you know, at, at least six hours a day, um, if they're above first grade, um, on, on the, an iPad or a laptop. Um, and so I wonder if there's also a, a possibility in that um, particular training to maybe have, I don't know, a video uh, uh, version of this so that we can maybe include it in, in all of the um, uh, uh, iPads or, or uh, devices that we distribute to our children and they can automatically see it or parents can see it or we can send it. You know, we have these parent um, uh, newsletters that are online. We no longer have uh, paper newsletters, but this would be a great way to just have a mass distribution of the parent, uh, vigilant parent, maybe just some highlights. Is, is, that, is that a possibility as well? Uh, most definitely, I think that's an excellent idea. Uh, we have worked on many PSAs and put it out social media uh, on different sites. Uh, I think pushing that to the next level, which is I think what you're hinting at is uh, an excellent idea and is something that we will take a look at. Wonderful. Yes, I could see this uh, video kind of running in our community centers and maybe at our libraries, anywhere we can have, you know, we have a captive audience of parents, uh, of course, in school systems as well. Thank you so much for your flexibility, but more importantly, for all the work that you're doing to make sure that our children are safe. Um, I can sleep uh, better knowing that we have this wonderful unit. Um, because my children are also online for a really long time. So, so thank you so much for all the work that you do. And, and with that, I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Sparso. Uh, I just wanted to echo um, uh, the thanks uh, that Council Member Ed and us just, uh, just gave the team. Um, unfortunately, we know with, the, with an increased online presence comes increased online risks. Um, and that this is critical to make sure that we, we have the resources uh, to educate communities and parents on how to protect our children through programs like the Vigilant Parent Program. And I love the video idea, and I think it would be fantastic to be able to partner and give that to all the school districts as they issue um, Chromebooks and all of those things, because the parents, I know in Franklin McKinley, um, they've, they've particularly, particularly at the outset of the pandemic, 
they did a lot of parent education um, on all the online components. I know if um, you had me go out and and, uh, and get somebody set up to do online learning right now, I would fail. <laughs> so they had to teach everyone, you know, all the different components and provide some um, some online training to parents. And I think the video would be a really great resource to just load on every one of those um, materials so that parents and families and educators could be mindful. So that's it. Very pleased to support it today. Okay. Any other comments? And Mayor, may I ask, um, do I need to include uh, those recommendations in the motion or is that okay, uh, Chief or uh, Lieutenant Anderson? I think it might be, I'm sorry, uh, Lieutenant Anderson, did you want to respond or Chief? Um, maybe the Chief might be able to answer on this one. Sure, I'm sorry, uh, Council Member, can, can you uh, re repeat the question? I know that uh, what I was gonna add was, I know folks wanted to know, learn more about the parent initiative and uh, we do have uh, or ICAC does have a, uh, a website, svicac.org. So Silicon Valley ICAC.org. Again, it's svicac.org. Uh, and it talks about all the great work um, uh, Lieutenant Anderson and his folks and the uh, adjoining or assisting agencies are doing uh, in that regard, along with the videos uh, that were mentioned. Um, in regards to the parent, uh, the vigilant parent initiative, and other videos that uh, the community can can watch uh, to protect their uh, their children online. Great. Um, so, uh, Mayor, I think you were going to indicate uh, whether I should include that or not. Yeah, I, I think it would be just good if if you wanted to um, include something specifically in the motion, just to articulate okay. exactly what you want in there. Thank so you. So. You uh, my motion will include uh, an integration of the parent vigilant videos um, uh, to be distributed in, in school devices um, in, partnership, in partnership with our school districts, um, possibly school devices or whatever other um, appropriate forms okay. of distribution, as well as training uh, for training that could be explored for um, children's uh, stress uh, indicators uh, that could be shared with our um, police officers. Okay. Um, and uh, the seconder, I believe, is Councilmember Sparsa, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you're fine. Could, could I just suggest, since I think it's really the library team that's um, overseeing the distribution uh, if you're referring to both the hotspots and the computers that we're trying to distribute to efforts to schools, is, is that what you're referring to, Councilmember Rennes? Well, Mayor, at this point, I think we've already done uh, the level of distribution that I, yeah. I don't think we have devices in our hands anymore. And so at this point, I think it's just connecting with the school districts and find a, a, the best way to distribute, whether okay. it's you know, a parent portal or on the devices themselves, and then they can figure that piece out. Okay. All right, and uh, Chief or Lieutenant Anderson, um, any concerns with those additions? No. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, let's vote then on the motion. Menes? Aye. Perales? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, I uh, inadvertently skipped over an item, important item, which was uh, item 3.7, which is the Board of Fair Campaign Political Practice Appointments. We have some interviews for yes. one remaining. The, um, the interviewee is not in, in attendance at this time. Okay. If he signs on before we get to the study session, we'll take him. Otherwise, we'll drop that item. Okay. We can come back to that then. Let's go to item 6.1, which is the construction contingency increase for the digester and thickener facilities project at our wastewater facility. 
Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Matt Fukuda, Assistant Director, Environmental Services Department. I am here today with uh, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works, as well as Mariana Chavez-Vasquez, Deputy Director of the Capital Improvement Program out at the Regional Wastewater Facility. Uh, quick background on the project itself. It is one of the largest and most complex projects of the Capital Improvement Program at the facility. Uh, you can see smack dab in the middle of the operational area are the four digesters in question. And although that footprint is pretty confined, as you can see from the blue lines, the, the project extends well be beyond that footprint with uh, some new construction, specifically the elevated pipe racks, which move the gas pipelines from the tunnels below the facility to above, as well as a new structure for our primary sludge screening and odor control, and also modifications to what we call our dis dissolved air flotation thickener tanks. Um, here's just the, some pictures of what I just discussed. Um, as you can see, a lot of the construction is complete. In fact, we're 94%, excuse me, 94 complete of the actual construction to date. Um, history. So back in 2013 is when we initiated design right at the, actually before our capital improvement program was officially formulated um, to Brown and Caldwell in 2016, the construction award was given to Walsh Construction for a base value of $107 million. Um, subsequently to that, in November 17 and May 18, we came to council with two con contingency increases for $15 million and $25 million respectively. Uh, the first one being primarily associated with uh, having to rehab some significantly deteriorated pipe. Um, the SES pipeline is what we call it there. And the latter second contingency being uh, having to do with PCB remediation of those tanks, but primarily having to do with seismic upgrades um, of the digesters themselves. The original uh, project completion was scheduled to be for 2019. However, with those delays that I just mentioned, as well as the delays we're going to speak about today, we're currently projecting a November 21 construction completion date with an additional year of testing, startup, and commissioning. Uh, this is just the visual representation of what I just discussed. The original contract time frame was 790 days with the first contingency adding another 140 and the second contingency adding 133 days. Um, and these are just some pictures of the work that was actually completed uh, relative to those two contingencies I talked about. This is just the gas um, right, reroute system that we had to install due to some uh, regulatory agency reinterpretation of, of um, some air emission standards that we had to adjust toward. Um, and this is the SES pipeline that I mentioned. I should note that this project was originally scheduled to be part of what we call our yard piping construction project, which was scheduled at a later date. However, during the course of our digester project, when we looked at tying into this, we encountered significant deterioration of these pipes. And rather than waiting to include this project in a later project, we decided to move, expedite it and move it forward and, and bring it into this project. And this was a, a large reason for that first contingency. Uh, a large reason for this con second contingency had to do with PCB mitigation and remediation. We encountered significantly more impacts than we had anticipated. And as far as the seismic ring beam that you see here in the top left and bottom, uh, that was due to a, a design error um, it should have been caught in the beginning. As you may have saw a note in the prior slides, um, we did settle with the design consultant on those design costs. Um, and then this is the result of the structural um, construction that was needed. Um, Mariana? Thank you, Nap. So what we are gonna discuss forward is uh, Nap did a good job summarizing our previous contingencies. We're gonna just talk about what has happened in this project since 2000, 2018 when we came last to council for our second continuous increase and now. So some of the things that we're experiencing are not new to this project or to our program. Uh, some are impacts due to the aging infrastructure that we are dealing with as part of the rehabilitation of the RWF. Uh, but specifically to this project, we have found a few additional items. So we, uh, as we finish the construction, uh, one significant item we have found is that we are experiencing some leakage in the digesters. Uh, there has been also the need for additional civil work 
and this is related mostly to the amount of uh, relocation of utilities and things we have had to do. Uh, we had since 2018, as you guys are aware, we have a lot more projects going on in our program. So there has been also the need to do coordination with other projects and add some items to the scope of, of the digested project just to address the interfaces. Uh, we continue to experience some underground conflicts. And then also because of the duration of the projects, there has been some updates to the electrical and fire codes that we are addressing now as part of construction. And the last one is a, a complex item that is just has to do with the integration of these new systems to our existing control system. This is a, the, the system that control all instrumentation and signals at the facility. Uh, so that has been a little bit more complicated than we were expecting. Uh, there is also, these are biological process. So we have a very complex testing startup and commissioning phase ahead of us. And there were some minimum impacts uh, associated with some of the design changes that NAV was referring to. And really the, the larger portion of it is the associated delays that go with this. The next slide, please. And uh, Nap, can you do the next slide? Yeah, I'm sorry, Marina. I'll... It froze up all of a sudden. Should I just continue talking? Oh, yeah, we can hear you fine, certainly. And... Okay, so well, well, Nap yeah. figures out what's going on. So I'll just I'll just continue going with the discussion of of this until we find the next slide. So we have been oh there you go. So one of the things that we were discussing was just the digester leakage, and we wanted just to show a few things just to kind of give you a sense of the dimensions and the complexity. So what we're seeing here is the final work completed, all concrete uh, work done, and we are experiencing really small cracks that we are repairing either on the bottom of the tank on the other side. And you can see in the picture some, some signage uh, that we use for our divers when they go in. So we have been some of doing some diver inspection just to try to figure out what's going on. And we are right now in the process of going kind of to the next step. We have completed all the uh, inspections and repairs and we need to do some additional work, but this has taken a little bit of time and caused some of the delays that we're referring to. Uh, mm -hmm. Next slide. Uh, the other thing about infrastructure and underground conflicts, basically everything that we have built in this project, we have found a conflict somewhere. So we just wanted to show you some pictures of the massive things that need to happen. Uh, on the left bottom, you can see the tunnels. Our tunnels are really old and congested. So for us to install new piping, sometimes this requires to uh, decommission and take out some of existing piping. Some of this piping is also uh, because of age either contaminated with asbestos or with uh, lead. So it has some additional requirements for us for abatement and to be able to move all these. Uh, and then just pictures of uh, electrical conduits. But sometimes when we have to do this excavation, you can see in the bottom right picture, the amount of preparation and work for us to basically have the excavation and sustain all the additional piping and things that are interfering. So all these is a really kind of complex and long process. Uh, right now, we're looking at their contingency increase, um, mostly related to the aging infrastructure that's around 3 million. Testing a startup and commissioning, we are assuming at 1.4 million. And redesign is minimum. That just has to do with the fact that we had to reaccommodate some of the equipment due to the new ring doing. But the most of the delay is really, uh, the most of the cost is on the delay, the time related overheads. Uh, we are still looking into potentially other things that could happen during the startup. Uh, obviously, there, there are some impacts because of COVID uh, and just some of the stuff that we have discussed with the startup and, and integration on the, on, into the DCS system. Uh, next slide. So this, again, is just a representation. If you do the click, uh, this is where we are right now, uh, graphic representation. Their increase uh, contingency will get us 237 days of additional uh, work that are required to complete the job. Next slide. So uh, we are looking into ways to mitigate this. I mean, uh, we right now are working on reviewing all the claims from the contractor. Uh, 
uh, what we have right now for you is a placeholder and that we are assuming as our maximum amount. But we are looking into options to minimize this. Uh, we're reviewing the strategies for the startup and commissioning. We are identifying opportunities to reduce the contractor overhead and negotiating also the COVID claims based on what we know right now is the city position. Uh, we are continuing to work with the contractor to optimize the remaining schedule in an effort to try to minimize this. Uh, one thing that we wanted to show here, uh, and this has been a really intense experience for us in terms of learning how our projects are going to go and how we're changing some of the approaches that we have to delivering projects. So originally, the contract amount for this project was around 107.9 million. And we have a relatively low contingency for what we see in our projects now. Uh, if you consider the contingency increase that we have had so far and what we are requiring, it would seem like it's a lot and it's a lot of stuff for a project. But one of the things that we want to make sure that is clear is that a lot of the issues that we have been addressing in this project were not really related to the scope originally of the digester project. So almost 15 million that we have spent was part of the SES pipeline and the structure that we had to replace. And that was actually part of a different project but that was gonna happen within the program in the future. The PCB remediation was also something that we were not expecting the extent that we had to do with that. And the, the other two are regulatory requirements and the delay cost with the PCB. And, and just to, to uh, for, for reference, uh, PCB remediation is regulated by federal law, so we had to go work with EPA, and EPA was basically not allowing us to continue work. So where we are right now, if we consider only the digester work, uh, the adjusted contract amount, once that we include the structural uh, modifications that we made, is a 124.3 million. Even with the contingency that we're adding right now, we are around 17.6%. This actually aligns with what we know now and what we are requesting now in projects that are really complex and that have a lot of rehabilitation involved. Uh, we're still, I mean, it is, it's not what we were expecting, but it's not completely out of what we should have known. And, and we'll discuss some of the changes that we have made with our program as a result of the learning experience that we have had here. We still are kind of mitigating and managing the risk of other things that could happen. Uh, as, as we mentioned, the start of the COVID impacts and any potential future delay is something that we're still managing, uh, but we think that we have a better plan moving ahead. Um, the next slide. And one thing that we want to do with our projects, just to kind of keep ourselves accountable of how our expensive uh, projects are doing, really, uh, is uh, expenditure compared to other peer agencies. So we we had already we previously showed where we were in the benchmarking of our digester. We were at $6.5 per gallon. With this additional contingency, that will bring us around $7 per gallon, but that is still within um, kind of the realm of what other agencies are expending in similar projects, and it's still way below what uh, other agencies in the Bay Area have spent, including SFPUC's Bay Mode and San Mateo. So what we have learned from this project has also allowed us to implement changes in the program. As Nap mentioned, this was one of our first projects that came out, out the door at the very beginning, 2013. So we right now, in all the projects after and all the future projects we have, we are doing more extensive condition assessment of the structures, equipment, and underground conditions. Um, we have also implemented all the requirements from EPA and we're doing more in-depth hazardous material surveys now prior to construction, so we could have like a better plan moving ahead with projects. Uh, we now know that projects that are related to rehabilitation of existing facilities and that have all the interactions that we have with other processes on site will require a higher construction contingency. So most of our projects are coming at 15% or 20%, depending on the um, amount of work and the extent of work. Uh, we have also developed all, all programmatic design standards for all the projects, uh, some based on this project and the, the things that we have learned. And we are also now, and this is something that was not available to us at the beginning when we started this project, we are also using alternative delivery methods for projects that we recognize that have a high risk. 
So DB, we're having progressive design block project. We finished our cogent. We have two other projects now on the design with that. And now we know that certain uh, projects that have a higher risk profile are better suited for that type of, of, of uh, approach for the leader. Next one. So the recommendation that we have for you today is the approval of this contingency increase. Uh, we have also the budgetary actions that are needed to, to do this. And with that, we can finalize the presentation and be ready for questions. Thank you, Marianne. All right, let's go to the public. Uh, first with comments and questions. Again, we're on item 6.1, which relates to the construction contingency on the digester and thickener facilities upgrade project. Tessa Woodmancy. Oh, thank you, Ana Licardo, for repeating what the topic is. That's really helpful as a good teacher of, of our democracy to help us with that. So thank you. Um, well, yeah, I wanted to comment on the digester issues of our the way we're dealing with our waste management, and that what Allery Middlebrook has said as a you know she's a a leader in our community of sustainability, um, urban sustainability is that we need to live where all of our needs are met in the same location and, and in one location, all of our needs for our life cycle, like plants and like plants that have made our, you know, our planet livable for us. We need to live that way too. All of our needs met in the same place. And that means even our, our wastes, like we used, you know, we need to figure out that that's, you know, that's permaculture. That's, you know, that's, that's the theme that we need to be going towards sustainability. And the way we're managing our own personal waste, we have to, re, you know, rethink about that too to compost it locally, and like we have in the past. And so, you know, that that's just the orientation is going towards um, a, a sustainable future is one where we're growing food locally and 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 taking care of our waste locally, all of that locally. And so that's that's sustainable. And I was just talking to my neighbor who's a scientist on Chile Avenue. And she said it takes 10 years to grow soil. And so we need to start that right now. And that's what I'm saying with 615, that we should buy it as a property and, and use, you know, think about our budget, that we buy it for $3 million and it be a demonstration project of how to take the asphalt and turn it into the garden of hearts delight again. That is our job. That's what, you know, the urgency of our three crises of climate, biological collapse and pollution. So in, in this area that's highly polluted, we need to be on the board of the of the money from Google. That three hundred million or two hundred million. Thank you. All right, uh, Savannah Perkins. Yes, thank you for calling on me. I am Savannah with Students for Sustainable Waste Policy, a student-run organization from San Jose State, and I have a question about the Cash for Trash program. I've been attempting to get information from people in the city and I have run into issues with people just not responding or they don't have the information and don't know where to send me. So I was hoping that someone could reach out to me after this meeting to answer some questions or get me in contact with someone who is in charge of the program. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Savannah. Uh Gavin Kinlan. Gavin, you just lifted your hand. Okay. I oh, Gavin, go ahead. Gavin, we're not able to hear you right now. It appears your device is muted. You're trying to speak. Ah, there you there go. There we go. I just got the prompt. Hi, my name is Gavin. I'm also here representing students for sustainable waste policy. Uh, to follow up on Cash for Trash, we see that it was included in Mayor Ricardo's budget message, so we do applaud you for your interest in its renewal, but we also have concerns about whether or not it will be a significant improvement from the rough started pilot program from November, so we were wondering what specific improvements would be made to the program, like would there be designated trash cans, because I remember that uh, the stench from rotting food was a major concern and also 
the rate at which people were being paid, the, the rate at which the trash was being picked up, and people not receiving their full payments due to the extended, uh, due to the delayed pickup. That's all. Thank, thank you, sir. I, actually, um, we're actually on the digester thickener project, but certainly something you're tally raised during public comment um, during open forum. Let's, let's return uh, to this item. Uh, Councilmember Menes. Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Mariana, and thank you, Napa. Uh, you know, I, I can't uh, quite wrap my head around the boatload of money we're talking about here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of money, and so I, I, I almost uh, feel obligated to ask questions because I think it's very important <laughs> that we have some clarity on some of these things. And, and so one of the things that uh, I wanted to ask about is the digest uh, the digesters, one, the, the ones with the leaks, I guess, uh, it seemed in reading the memo that it, it was an evolving issue and we were still, you didn't expect that the, it was gonna be an issue that would be the responsibility of the contractors, but more our responsibility, but it seemed to be evolving. So is it possible that the outcome is gonna be that it's not gonna be our responsibility or, or is that what you expect the outcome to be? Um, I think we have a plan. Uh, and I think once that we execute the plan that we have, we will be able to resolve these. What is more like due diligences that we are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, we found a few items that, that we identified that was a workmanship issue. So the contractor was responsible for that, they did that. Okay. Uh, so we, to the extent that we're finding things that they are responsible for, they are doing the work, the rework. Uh, and we have a plan moving forward. We just need to uh, run it by our water board. Uh, but we think we're, we have a way to, to resolve this issue. Okay. And, okay. and Councilmember Jimenez, if I could add, Please. as Mariana alluded to, you know, we are absolutely doing our due diligence right now. We are, we have not, even though we're coming to you now with a request for $14 million, and we mentioned our time-related overtime and delays, overhead, excuse me, we are still in negotiations with the contractor right now. We have a specialized consultant on board assessing their schedules, because it's a very complicated. It's not, it's not just not a matter of, you know, a, a MS project off, you know, office. Yeah. It's, it's very yeah. specialized. So we have a specialized person looking at the schedules, looking at what they're charging us or claiming the charges per day on these things. Right. So, you know, we, we have some preliminary data back where we're meeting with the contractor over the next couple of weeks with, with several questions that we have, because we want to make sure we get the days right and the amount of per day right. So that's the multipliers right now. So, so that the final numbers you're seeing now aren't final yet. I mean, we're hoping to, you know, our hope is that that gets reduced a little bit, but we, but we can't tell at the moment. Right. Okay. All right. The, the other question I had is what is it, what is the useful life of the, of all the changes that we're making there? Mm -hmm. so once that we are completed, they will have like all equipment, uh, equipment installed has a useful, a useful life of 15 to 20 years and the concrete is will basically will be as new for another 50 years of life at least. Okay, and the reason I asked that is I know in the memo it also mentioned that uh, you anticipated some inaccuracies as, as it relates to maybe past drawings and identification of certain lines and things of that nature. Can you guys hear Jimmy just fine? I feel like I have an echo. I'm sorry, I, I missed the last part oh, of the question. So, so, so it seems like in the in the memo you identified some of the uh, unforeseen issues that uh, maybe some of the drawings or, or things in the past that were prepared were just inaccurate or maybe more inaccurate than you expected. <laughs> uh, and so obviously if, if the useful life is 15 to 20 years, uh, what I'm curious about is how are we approaching things differently now? I mean, was it just technology back then or codes that didn't require certain things? Or I, I guess I would hate that we go through this process. Yeah, and, and let me just answer that for you. Uh, that's not gonna happen again. Uh, it, it's a matter of records, of timing, of things that got lost. It was before digital times. Uh, we are right now, one of the things that is different, we have extensive GIS layers and systems that get documented as we do construction. Also, uh, we are doing photographs, all these things. They are all available for future projects. And all our projects include, once that they are completed, something that we, uh, we refer to as record drawings. So we have contract drawings. That is what the project looked like before we started construction. <laughs> all construction changes are documented and redlined. And at the end, we have contract documents that show exactly what happened on site on all the aspects of the process. We are doing that with all our projects. 
Okay. So all our records moving forward will be completely updated and to the, the best of our abilities accurate. Cool. So at the end of its useful life, no issues that we're encountering now, right? There should be no issues that we encounter like we're doing now. Okay, cool. And the last thing I would just say, thank you for the information, is that I was super fascinated by the divers. And I was very excited to see a photo of one of them. Uh, I won't ask you what they're diving in to. They're diving in clean water right now. I'm sorry? Clean water. Is, is absolutely clean. We're just filling okay. the digesters with, with clean water right now. Oh, very good. Okay, because my mind went many places, as you can imagine. And so I, I figured that's why we were paying 200 something thousand dollars for divers. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for the information. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Mahan. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks, uh, Nap and, and Mariana for the report. Um, appreciate the retrospective analysis and, and learnings. It's really important. Just a couple of quick questions. On the contingency funds that, that you plan to increase for future projects, do you have access to benchmarking data from other cities and, and other, other government bodies that do these kinds of projects just so we have more data points and, and are better able to target what those contingency funds ought to actually look like? Yes, and we, I mean, we can have maybe also Matt chiming in for our regular uh, projects in the city for public works. Anywhere between 10, 15, 20 is really a high contingency, uh, but 10, 15% is a normal number for a project. The way that we are approaching our program, uh, things that are in the middle of operations that require a lot of complex shutdowns and all that, is in the 15 to 20%, like what we're seeing in this project. Other projects that are greenfield, no interferences, 10 to 15%. And maybe, uh, and this is uh, consistent with other agencies. Maybe Matt can help just to give you a sense how much is the contingency that we carry in public works projects. Yeah, sure, Mariana. Thanks, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works. Yeah, and anytime you're retrofitting something really old, it's going to be on the higher end of the numbers Mariana was just quoting. So, um, you know, for a brand new park or something it's going to where it's just on a you know empty slate it's going to be maybe closer to 10 percent but when you're retrofitting something old it's going to be closer to 15 to 20 percent like mariana is mentioning so thank you okay and are we i apologize if i misinterpreted this my understanding of your slide 15 was that we're currently at about 23.5 percent is that right uh we are at i think it was six 17.6 percent uh, we're closer to the 20%. I mean, Matt, if NAP has the slide, we can tell you exactly where we are. I, so, so I was looking at unanticipated issues, 29.2 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just had it up. It was the middle yeah. pie chart. I was I wondering did. how you moved from that to the third pie chart. If you could just yes. explain that again. So, so just for clarity, what we're trying to show, uh, the scope of the original project was rehabbing our digester staffed uh, new screen buildings gas pipe. The pipeline and the wire structure was a scope completely out of the original scope of the project. This is a project that in a regular time, we would have put out for bidding outside of this contract. We had to include it in just because of the urgency was a safety issue. Uh, PCB remediation is not, it's a, it's a cost that we have to and pay to basically remediate and, and get rid of all the contaminated the soil and all that. It Mary. doesn't add value to the contract itself. Uh, the regulatory requirements, again, this was a delay that we had to pay because of issues with the airport. It's not related to the project itself. And then the delay cost was a combination of, of all these different issues, but it doesn't add the capital cost of the project. So that's what you see going from the 107 to the 124. The 124 is the actual contract value. Like it's, it's what we're paying for the digesters and the additional structural stuff. So when you look at what is actually related to that scope, is a 17.6%. Everything else was unrelated scope. Got it. Makes more sense this time. Thank you. I, I appreciate you taking the extra time to go through that. And then um, the other question was just in your slide on the, the bullet points of learnings for future projects, mm -hmm. I was also hoping you could go into a little more detail on what you mean by alternative delivery methods for higher risk projects. Yes. So, so right now our program is using two different delivery methods. One is the one that we are showing here. That's a traditional one, is design, bid, build. So we, con we contract with a designer, they finish our contract documents, we put it out for bid, and we go with the lowest bidder 
as municipal code and they, they, they get the job and they complete the work. Then if there are issues, if there are unexpected conditions, all these different things, the contractor will just let the city know and then it's our responsibility to figure out how to fix it. We are using alternative delivery methods. Uh, we are using progressive design build. So we're using that for our third project right now. What you do then is that the contract that you enter with is not just with a designer, it's with a design builder. So you are working with the builder at the same time that you are doing the design, identifying risk and all that. And when you get to the end of the design, you get a guarantee maximum price. So rather than have your low bid plus contingency, you still will have a contingency, but it's a smaller or, or, or more um, contained. And then you have a guarantee price based on whatever it is that all the uh, studies, alternatives, all that, and the contractor or design builder is responsible for that. So if things happen, they will have to share in the risk because it's on them to fix it. Not, and some of it will be still on the city, but in general, they will have more to do with, with all that. So now in projects that these, like these that have a lot more risk and a higher risk profile, we will not do it as a DDD. We will go straight to a design build uh, method. And if, if I could, council member, just to kind of give you a little background on that. Years ago, the voters um, approved for the city to be able to use design build. And then, uh, but that still didn't allow us to do it at the wastewater facility. Subsequently, law changed that allowed us to do that. Um, and so Mariana described the benefits of that. I would liken to trying to build this project with uh, the traditional design bid build, which, which we did, is, is like delivering a project with, uh, with one or two hands tied behind your back. Um, we would not uh, choose to deliver a project like this uh, into that traditional method. Um, and as Mariana pointed out, um, you know, a, a much better way for delivering this type of project is through progressive design build, which really transfers or shares the risk with the contractor and a design entity. Great, thanks, Dave. That's really helpful, and thanks, Mariana. That was exactly where I was going. Was was essentially how do we better share the cost overrun risks with contractors, and and that's that's great to learn more about. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And that was my last question. Thank you, um, Vice Mayor. I'm going to ask you to step in. Uh, I believe Councilmember Cohen is next. Yeah, just one last question. I think I've asked you this. I certainly, Mariana, when we were there on Friday, I talked a lot about this project. Uh, it's impressive work that's being done, uh, large scope. This this project, this particular uh, issue with the corroding pipe was on the roadmap to be addressed at a future time. Is that correct? I'm sorry, I think I, I, I missed the last part of your the, question. I'm so sorry. The large new issue with the, um, the that collapsing pipeline that needs to be replaced. Oh. That yes, on the roadmap at some, in the future to be part of a future project. Yes, it's already done. That's this, this pipe that you see there that was one of the worst uh, cases of corrosions we had. Uh, that's already done, but it was part originally in the budget for a project that was supposed to happen later on. So, I mean, just kind of move it, move it ahead. Important piece of information here that I think people should also be aware of is that this means that money that would have been spent later is being spent now and won't be spent later. So it it's not necessarily completely unanticipated. It's just that it had to be included right now because of the emergency nature of the, of the repairs, but that the project will um, would have been paid for later and that'll free up that budget. I mean, we're spending it now and, it was, and we're not necessarily spending more money overall than we would have been spending. Is that, is that a fair statement? Correct, that is, Council Member. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we had a motion yet, so I'll move that we, um, the increased contingency for the wastewater treatment plant work. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Tony? Menas? Aye. Morales? Aye. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Locardo? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. On to item three. We should be, we should be, this is Tony, we should be going to 3.7, the interview for the BFCPP. Great. Thank you, Tony. Ed. 
Daniel is on. Um, I just am giving him permission to start his video. So he is on and ready for your questions. All right. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's start out. Uh, give us, uh, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and why you uh, want to serve and give us uh, a little bit more information about you. All right. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Dama. I'm from uh, San Jose, California, but originally from Ethiopia. Um, you know, uh, I live here like about 18 years and I just want to serve, you know, my city, whatever I can. And actually, you know, during this pandemic, you know, I had a lot of time and, you know, try to, you know, do something different. And, you know, I go to the website of San Jose City, you know, and, uh, you know, I sign up, you know, to get just involved and to get you know, no more knowledge. And thank you. Thank you. Um, Daniel, I'm going to go to my colleagues and see if they have any questions for you. Okay. And I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, I have a question. This is Sergio. Go ahead, Sergio. I wasn't able to raise my hand. I apologize. But uh, just to clarify with Tony, is there only one, is there, there's one vacancy left? Can you remind me where we are? Yes, there's one vacancy that um, the term ends 2023. That's the shorter term, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'll move appointment uh, of, of this gentleman. That's here he is. Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, we have a, a hand raised for public comments. Well, actually it was taken down, so. Hey, Jimenez? Aye. Morales? Aye. Owen? Owen? Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Thank you. All right. Congratulations, Daniel. Thank you very much. All right. On to item 3.6, um, discussion and possible actions regarding campaign finance regulations. And... Um, Council? Council member, yes. or vice mayor, I'm sorry. Um, if it's okay, um, we'll jump in with a, a little bit of a presentation to start the study session. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, Mark Danny from our office is gonna do an introduction and then he has um, an expert who will give an overview on campaign finance law. And then Mark has some um, additional information on uh, uh, local regulations, and that's just to provide an overview for the council and for your study session. Great, go ahead. Okay, uh, good uh, afternoon, uh, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce um, Professor Richard Hasten. Um, I hope I have the pronunciation of that correct. Um, uh, he is the Chancellor Professor of Law and Political Science at the University of California, Irvine. He's a nationally recognized expert in election law and campaign finance regulation, uh, writing as well in the areas of legislation and statutory interpretation, remedies and torts. He's also the co-author of leading case books in election law and remedies and over 100 articles on election law issues published in a number of journals, including the Harvard Law Review, Stanford Law Review and Supreme Court Review. He's also served as a CNN election law analyst in 2020. Um, Professor Hasten also worked with the city of San Diego in defending their campaign finance laws against a constitutional challenge that went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal and assisted uh, the city of San Diego in redrafting portions of its campaign finance laws. Uh, and so I'll turn the floor over uh, to him. He has a presentation on um, you know, constitutional laws that relates to uh, campaign finance regulation. And so uh, 
if he is on and, and can uh, share, I, the floor is his. Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody see me and hear me? Yes, we can. Great. And it's, it's Hassan. Uh, <laughs> they get it wrong on CNN too. So, uh, uh, but uh, nice to meet all of you. And uh, I'm happy to uh, assist you. Uh, Mark asked me for kind of a campaign finance 101 presentation. And I think it's really smart to uh, have this presentation uh, or something like this before you get into actually drafting legislation because a lot of what is going to matter in terms of what you're allowed to do or not allowed to do is gonna depend on what the courts say. And so having an understanding of what's permissible and not permissible, what the range is of what's allowed is, is a good starting point. Uh, it'll save a lot of headaches later by drafting something that's constitutional and something that is uh, acceptable to the courts, and then going through the process of uh, extended litigation. I've been involved in some of that extended litigation and it can be quite expensive uh, when uh, cities have to engage in it. And, and San Jose has in the past been involved in some of that litigation in the pre-Citizens United uh, era. So I'm basically going to talk about three things in my presentation. I think I'm planning to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes and then take whatever questions you have. Um, first, just explain the types of campaign finance laws that they are, speaking generally. Second, talk about the uh, First Amendment limitations on campaign finance rules that the Supreme Court and other uh, courts have uh, implemented. And then talk about specific challenges and questions uh, that we're facing today, uh, as opposed to uh, what, um, where things might have been even a few years ago, as the composition of the United States Supreme Court has changed. So just to give you the basics, there are four different types of campaign finance laws, speaking generally, and, and laws are adopted separately on the state, uh, federal, and local level. Uh, and so, so some laws uh, that apply to campaign finance on the state level will, will apply in San Jose. The federal laws mostly apply to federal elections, although there are a few uh, related to foreign uh, money in elections that apply even to local elections. So four different types of campaign finance laws. There are expenditure or spending limits. These would limit how much money a person or entity could spend independently supporting or opposing a candidate. Also candidate spending limits would fall into this category. All right, so one idea is you can't spend any money. And as we'll see, the only type of uh, entity for which this is constitutional right now is our foreign entities, foreign individuals governments uh, and uh, persons. Contribution limits, limiting how much money a person or entity can give to a candidate, to a committee, or to a political party. Very common uh, to have contribution limits, as uh, San Jose does, on how much someone, for example, can donate to a city council member. Disclosure rules. These are rules that require that spending or contributions be um, publicly available. And these disclosure rules sometimes require reports be filed with the government. Sometimes they require disclosure on the face of a document or on the face of an advertisement. That's sometimes referred to by the language of a disclaimer. That's just a technical term for a disclosure that's on a document. Like when it says paid for by the Chamber of Commerce, that would be a disclaimer if it appears on an ad. And the fourth kind of laws are public financing laws, laws that say, um, if you agree, for example, to limit uh, your spending or to limit the contributions you accept, uh, you will get some money uh, as a form of um, uh, public, uh, public funded. And, and there are different um, mechanisms for providing that public funding as I'm going to talk about. So those are the four types of laws. And all four of these laws uh, have been, um, all four of these laws have been um, uh, contested in various courts over time. And when the United States Supreme Court or lower courts are faced with contests over campaign finance laws, they're typically arguing that the laws violate the United States Constitution's First Amendment. The First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech and association, and it applies, the First Amendment applies to federal, state, and local laws, right? So it doesn't matter if it's uh, there could be a constitutional problem if it's the city of San Jose or if it's Congress that passes the law. And typically speaking, when courts face campaign finance challenges under the First Amendment, they engage in a kind of balancing 
where they compare the infringement on the rights of speech and association with the government's interest, for example, the government's interest in preventing corruption of elections. So the, the general framework is one of balancing, and that means that how the courts conduct the balancing gives you the um, sense of whether or not laws are likely to be upheld or not. Because when the courts engage in balancing, as you probably know, sometimes the courts look very closely at a law that's called strict scrutiny. When a law is subject to strict scrutiny, it's almost always struck down. Sometimes the courts take a much laxer approach to review of campaign finance laws. And in those cases, the laws are more likely to be upheld. So what I'm going to do uh, is talk about the, uh, how the courts have addressed the constitutional questions in each of the four areas, the expenditure limits, the contribution limits, the disclosure rules, and the public financing rules. Generally speaking, the Supreme Court has said that spending limits apply to individuals, apply to corporations, and apply to unions in both candidate elections and ballot measure elections violate the First Amendment. The famous uh, first case here is a case called Buckley versus Vallejo. Uh, Citizens United was the case that applied the rule from Buckley that applied to individuals, to corporations, and to labor unions. So if uh, Google uh, or your local um, business down the block decides they want to spend money to support or oppose candidates for office, or if anyone decides they want to spend money to support or oppose a ballot measure that is on the um, uh, uh, that's on uh, the ballot in San Jose, no spending limits. You cannot limit someone's spending. But the court has upheld spending limits applied against foreign entities. That's the only example we have of spending limits in the modern period that have been upheld uh, by the courts. And the case is a case called Blumen versus Federal Election Commission. The Supreme Court didn't even issue a decision, but just affirmed a lower court that said that um, such spending limits are justified by the interest in self-government, the idea that it should be uh, American citizens uh, who decide who should be elected to office and who uh, can contribute, uh, who can spend or contribute in those elections. When a spending limit is challenged, it's judged under a strict scrutiny standard. That's the toughest constitutional standard. The, the Blumen case is unusual because it applied strict scrutiny and it upheld the law. In every other instance where the court has addressed a spending limit, it has applied strict scrutiny and, re and rejected the law. The government uh, back in Buckley, back in the 1976 case, which is the, the key case, in 1976, the government said such laws limiting spending in elections, for example, limiting, say, billionaires from spending as much as they want on elections, the government said, how about an interest in promoting equality? What about the idea of political equality? Two people might have the same interests in an election, uh, but one might be wealthy and be able to have much more influence. The Supreme Court rejected equality as a permissible interest under the First Amendment, said it was wholly foreign to the First Amendment. And this is probably the most important thing I'm going to tell you today, which is that you cannot justify any laws that you would purport to pass and that would be subject to a constitutional challenge on an interest in leveling the playing field or make, avoiding the drowning out of voices of average citizens. Uh, that kind of interest is constitutionally impermissible. And we have at least one case, a case involving a public financing system where the court looked at how a city, uh, or actually a state in this case was Arizona, described its public financing system as leveling the playing field and said, that's an impermissible equality interest. And that was one of the reasons that the court struck down the public financing plan. So you have to be very careful in thinking about the interests and in articulating what interests you might put forward to justify a law. The government also tried to justify spending limits by saying that they were necessary to prevent corruption, uh, cor corruption, things like bribery and uh, other kinds of uh, agreements to exchange dollars for political favors. And while the court agreed that preventing corruption is a compelling interest, it's, it's, it's something that can justify a campaign finance law, when the spending is independent, the court said, it cannot corrupt a candidate. The court repeated that in Citizens United. It's a controversial idea, but the courts have said, if spending is independent, the anti-corruption interest cannot justify such a law. Now, in contrast to contribution limits, the Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld individual contribution limits, beginning in the Buckley case, 
contribution limits in candidate elections, in candidate elections. The court applies something less than strict scrutiny. It's called exacting scrutiny. And the court has held that contribution limits, for example, saying that city council members cannot accept more than $500 from an individual in an election. The court has said that those kinds of limits are justified to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. But the court more recently has said that if contribution limits are very low and low in part compared to what other cities and other states are doing, then the amount can be unconstitutional. So there have been some, there was just a recent Supreme Court case uh, called Thompson, where the court sent back an Alaska law that imposed very low contribution limits and suggested that if the contribution limits are too low, they're unconstitutional. The court has also said you cannot have contribution limits in ballot measure elections. Again, corruption is the only interest to justify contribution limits. And in ballot measure elections, there's no candidate to corrupt. The court has, however, allowed a ban on direct contributions by corporations to candidates. The case in which the court held that, that case is kind of old. If the court revisited that question, it might change its mind. But right now, uh, the court has said that you can ban contributions uh, by corporations directly to candidates. It hasn't weighed in on whether you could ban contributions from lobbyists, which is something that has been litigated in the lower courts. On disclosure rules, the court has generally upheld disclosure rules in both candidate and ballot measure elections. The court also applies an exacting scrutiny, so less than strict scrutiny, in looking at these limits. And here, in the disclosure context, the court has recognized three kinds of interests that can justify disclosure rules. The court said that disclosure is a, is a more narrowly tailored solution than limits. It's a better way to deal with the First Amendment, some of the justices have said. And they said it's justified to prevent corruption. So if you can see the relationship between spending or contributions and government action, that can prevent corrupt deals. It provides voters with information. So if voters know that an interest group is backing a candidate. That helps voters know what that candidate likely stands for. And it helps to enforce other laws. So if you have a ban on foreign spending, you can look for that foreign spending if you have adequate disclosure. The court has said that the First Amendment requires that disclosure laws exempt those who face a risk of harassment. So if you could be harassed for unpopular political views, you can get an exemption from any laws, or sometimes the laws actually build in an exemption for those who can demonstrate to a government body that they would be harassed if their identities were disclosed. In more recent years, some of the more conservative justices have expressed concerns about privacy, uh, people being um, um, contacted or otherwise uh, potentially facing ridicule for contributions that they make, and the court right now, in fact, just a week from today, the court's going to consider a case out of California called um, Americans for Prosperity versus Becerra, which is about this exacting scrutiny standard. That's not exactly a campaign finance case. It's a case about whether nonprofits have to disclose information to the state of California about their donors. But it's a case that could have big implications for the constitutionality of disclosure laws uh, going forward. And finally, onto the constitutional scrutiny of public financing laws. The Supreme Court in the Buckley case upheld presidential public financing so long as that participation is voluntary. So a government cannot require candidates to participate in a public financing scheme. It has to be voluntary. What makes it voluntary is that there has to be a viable path to be able to run for office without participating in the public financing scheme. The court applied strict scrutiny though in, uh, a few years ago in a case called Arizona Free Enterprise. This is the Arizona case I mentioned a few minutes ago where you were entitled in Arizona to a particular amount of public financing and you'd get extra funds if you were facing wealthy opponents, either a wealthy candidate or a wealthy super PAC running ads against you. Additional funding was included if you faced a wealthy opponent, the Supreme Court said that this additional matching provision was unconstitutional because it was an attempt to level the playing field. It was an attempt to equalize things and it impinged on the First Amendment rights of those who are wealthy who want to spend whatever they want uh, on their political positions. The court once again said that the equality interest is an impermissible interest for 
uh, creating campaign finance laws. The court hasn't weighed in on the most popular form of public financing plans uh, that are out there now uh, among cities, which are multiple matches for small campaign contributions. So in New York, for example, I think it's if you give a contribution of $250 or less, the public financing matches that on a six to one basis. We also have the experience of Seattle, uh, which has been using campaign finance vouchers. And it's one of the first areas where they're trying to give voters public financing vouchers that they can then distribute to candidates in elections. Supreme Court has not weighed in on the constitutionality of those types of plans, but those plans have a better chance of success uh, than uh, the kind of plan that was struck down in the Arizona free enterprise case. Finally, I wanna to turn to challenges and questions. Um, it's very difficult if you are trying to uh, create a campaign finance system uh, that is rational and that achieves your goals if you are um, you know, trying to achieve something that is meaningful, but also that conforms to what the Supreme Court uh, requires. And so, for example, when Congress passed its uh, major campaign finance laws back in 1974, uh, it had no idea that the spending limits that it enacted would be struck down and the contribution limits would be upheld. That wasn't the plan that Congress initially had. What that meant was that lots of money started going to outside groups. This became even more of an issue after the Citizens United case, when people started forming so-called super PACs. These are committees that accept contributions in unlimited amounts from individuals and corporations, and that make only independent expenditures. The theory is that because the Supreme Court has said that independent expenditures cannot corrupt, then contributions to fund independent expenditures can't corrupt. And so given the rise of super PACs and other outside groups, there's a question of how effective limits can be, given that the limits cannot apply to these groups. And so you can limit how much goes to, say, a city council uh, candidate, but you can't limit how much outside groups can spend uh, on uh, or, or take contributions to spend on independent spending supporting limits. Another challenge that we see is uh, that the disclosure rules become a kind of cat and mouse game. The FPPC or a city or Congress or the Federal Election Commission create disclosure rules. Those disclosure rules have some loopholes and those loopholes are then uh, a means for evading the disclosure rules. And then the disclosure rules are rewritten and we see the cycle repeat itself. And so one thing that's become clear is that disclosure rules have to be periodically revisited to make sure that they are um, uh, effective. On the federal level, for example, disclosure rules do not apply in the same way to ads that appear on social media or on the internet as they do to TV and radio ads. And as more campaign advertising moves to the internet, more and more of it is undisclosed because it's not subject to the regulation and Congress hasn't updated the regulation. And the final point I want to make uh, is that uh, addressing these issues is a moving target. The uh, Supreme Court has seen a large change in personnel over the last few years. It now has a supermajority of conservative justices. Those justices have, in different opinions, expressed skepticism about campaign finance laws. And so things that we had always accepted at, at thinking that the court would agree would be constitutional might now be subject to new constitutional challenges. So we're entering into this period. The Supreme Court has not weighed in too much in the campaign finance area in say the last uh, five years, but every time the court has taken a campaign finance case in the last 10 years, it has either struck down a law or limited a law's application. Uh, the court has not upheld a single uh, contribution limit or spending limit that is seen aside from uh, back uh, right after Citizens United went up, it upheld the foreign spending ban. I think foreign spending bans are probably uh, on solid ground, but beyond that, I think a lot of things that are that's uh, considered constitutional today would not necessarily be constitutional if faced uh, if the issue comes uh, before the the new justices of the Supreme Court. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Hassan. Um, Nora, do we have any other? 
Yes. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Mark is uh, going to give an overview of the um, local rules and um, uh, the professor was um, given the one memo and professor maybe uh, you can take a moment and if you haven't had a chance to look at that, make sure you have a chance to review our one memo um, uh, leading into the closed sessions um, also. So there may be some questions. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll try and read after. that now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll be sharing my screen with everybody. Uh, <clears throat> As Nora mentioned, my name is Mark Bonney, and I'm here tonight to provide an overview of the city's campaign finance laws. So following off of the professor's presentation, uh, I'll be discussing uh, some of the requirements that are specific to elections in the city of San Jose and what the, the requirements uh, are in elections. And, and many of you are, are probably all aware of having run campaigns uh, to get on the council, but this presentation is not a comprehensive summary of all campaign and ethics laws under Title 12 of the Municipal Code. So if anyone has any questions about a particular topic, please feel free to ask at the conclusion of my presentation. And ah. um, the Political Reform Act is the basis for all of California's campaign finance laws. It regulates the formation and fundraising activities of state and local campaign committees. It also imposes requirements on such committees to track contributions and expenditures and requires certain disclaimers, the things that you see paid for by, not authorized by a candidate or candidate control committee. Uh, those are all uh, required under the Political Reform Act. Local candidates are generally required to comply with the minimum standards of the Political Reform Act, but there are areas where ju local jurisdictions are permitted to impose stricter requirements. And the city has done that in a few areas, imposing stricter limits on fundraising, requirements for debt retirement, additional reporting requirements, and uh, disclaimers. So the city's contribution limit means that candidates for office cannot raise more than an established amount from a single person or entity. The limit is currently set at 600 for council office and $1,300 for the mayor. Uh, the amount adjusts with inflation, but is subject to council approval. Uh, the next adjustment will occur uh, sometime later this year for the 2022 election cycle and the process is the clerk will do the adjustment uh, based on the CPI and then bring forward the item for council approval. Uh, there are no limits, however, on how much a candidate can contribute to his or her own campaign uh, with their own personal funds, uh, except that a candidate may not loan more than $20,000 at any given time uh, to their own campaign. In addition to the contribution limit, the city has a fundraising window that begins 180 days before the election and continues until the day before the primary and runoff elections, if applicable. Uh, for the June 8th, 2022 primary, uh, for example, the fundraising window will begin December 10th, 2021, and will continue until the end of the day on June 7th, 2022. And for those that advance to the runoff, then it will begin until the day before the runoff. Uh, there is no post-election fundraising permitted in the city of San Jose unless for the purpose of an election contest or recount or as part of a legal defense fund. Uh, there are also no officeholder accounts permitted. And finally, there are limits on the transfer of campaign contributions to other campaign committees or to another campaign committee of the candidate. In addition to the fundraising limits, candidates are required to retire all campaign debt then 180 days of the election, and any unpaid debt left over after 180 days is deemed to be a campaign contribution subject to applicable limits. And there are other requirements there about good faith efforts on the part of a, a campaign vendor to collect and how that would not be uh, considered a campaign contribution. Any funds left over after paying off all campaign debt are considered surplus funds, which under the municipal code within 180 days after withdrawal, defeat, or election to office, may be returned to contributors on a pro rata basis, turned over to the general fund of the city or used uh, for attorney's fees and other costs in connection with election contests or recount. But under the Munich code, they're not permitted to be used for any other purpose. With regard to reporting, generally the municipal code incorporates the reporting requirements of the Political Reform Act, which includes semi-annual reports, two pre-election statements in election years and 24 hour reporting for contributions over $1,000 
made within 90 days of an election. But under the municipal code, there are additional reporting requirements, uh, including an additional pre-election statement that is due before the day of the election, disclosure of post-election payment agreements or contingency uh, payments to consultants or campaign staff, and disclosure of the source of all personal funds contributed to a candidate's, commit, uh, candidate's campaign. So where did the candidate get their personal funds in order to make the contribution to their campaign must be disclosed on a form that's filed with the city clerk. In addition, uh, there are no anonymous contributions. Uh, all contributions, even those under $100, must identify the source of the contribution. And independent committees uh, must report a legible copy of electioneering communications if in a printed form or a transcript of the electioneering, electioneering communication in a spoken form, and that needs to also be filed with the city clerk. Um, and election communications um, under the municipal code are those that are sent within 90 days of an election. So the city's disclaimer uh, 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 ordinance uh, requires disclaimers on all electioneering communications sent by independent expenditure committees. And again, those are communications sent within 90 days of the election. Uh, for printed materials, the disclaimer is here on the slide. Uh, and then for spoken materials, uh, it needs to include a paid for by uh, disclaimer. Um, however, in 2017 and 2018, the California legislature created a comprehensive scheme for disclosures on political advertisements, including those distributed on the internet and through social media, and required the disclosure of the names of the top three contributors of $50,000 or more on many different types of political advertisements. And this is referred to as the uh, Disclosure, or I believe the Disclose Act. Um, and the passage of this law has in many ways subsumed the city's disclaimer requirements and has created some discrepancies in the phrasings of the city's disclaimers versus those that are required under state law, which we've had to reconcile. So um, there, it, there is um, uh, technical updating uh, would be merited in order to better conform uh, the city's disclaimer requirements with, with those that are required, on, required under state law. And then finally, enforcement of the city's campaign laws is vested with the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices, established under the Municipal Code to monitor compliance with the campaign finance and other ethics laws under Title 12. The board responds to complaints and uses an independent evaluator model to investigate alleged violations. Uh, the evaluator uh, presently is uh, the law firm of Hanson Bridget, which there is a representative from that firm uh, that is here today to answer any questions. Um, and the board responds to uh, complaints that are filed. And if the board, um, after a, a hearing and, a, and a, a process where the complaint is investigated, if the board finds a violation, it may find mitigating circumstances and take no action, issue a public statement or reprimand, uh, require corrective action and or impose civil penalties. And uh, with that, that concludes my presentation. And I'll make myself available for any questions uh, that the council may have as well. Thank you, Mark. All right, uh, are there any other presentations, Nora, before we go to discussion? Uh, there are not. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for getting us through this. Um, let's go to the public now. Uh, and anybody in the public would like to comment on this. Uh, this is relating campaign finance regulations, item 3.6. Feel free to raise your hand and then we'll come back to council for discussion. Uh, Brenda Centejas. Hi, my name is Brenda Centejas. I've been a resident of San Jose for over 30 years. I live currently in District 5. I'm here today to support the proposal of Council Member Jimenez for the campaign finance reform. Um, this will ensure candidates and elected officials to retain their independence to serve everyday people and not wealthy corporations. Banning campaign donations from landlords, developers, developers, contractors, while they are trying to do business with city common sense measures that keep businesses and political separate. Many special interests will not play their way to the front line. It's important we act and support council member Jimenez's proposal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jay Tonko. Welcome. Afternoon, everybody, Mayor, Council. I'm sure I don't need to explain to you guys uh, my experience with campaign finance and you know disclosure information. Um, it was a rough 
2020 election cycle. One of the things that I thought was really important to bring up was the lack of trust that's doing within our community over these issues and our responsibility and your responsibility as leaders to figure out the best way to build that trust back again. And on countless occasions, I would meet people uh, at the door or over the phone that thought that my opponent, Council Member Davis, was the one responsible for literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in negative attack ads. When I know that wasn't her intention or her leadership, and despite the fact that we may see things very differently from a political lens, that overall divisiveness, that distrust to the community is incredibly damaging. We really need to look at all the avenues we have to create a system that limits the appearance of corruption, that makes sure that residents can and do have trust in their elected officials. On more than one occasion, people would tell me they didn't really care about the political leaning of the person that they were electing. They just wanted to make sure that they, that person was being honest. And that's a, a big challenge that we're facing to overcome because there's a lot of people that, that feel the same way. Um, I think it's really important that we go forward and support all the measures in uh, Council Member Jimenez's memo I want to thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Tessa Whitmancy. Yes. Hello. Good. Thank you for um, the display of the time because sometimes I don't get that. And on top of it, I'd like it to be looked into why my hand keeps going being put down. I want to know who has control of the hand. So please get back to me on that because I'm noticing it constantly being turned off my hand. That's wrong. Okay. So please get back to me on that. Okay. So I want to argue with... Um, Jake Tonko in saying that Deb Davis was um, a, a neutral party, that our candidate was neutral in terms of her support that she was getting from the um, Chamber of Commerce and the police department. And, and we can't say that the, these things are separate. So yes, I appreciate um, Sergio Jimenez saying that we need to take those who do business with our city, including our police, okay? Because they are the biggest part of our um, economy our budget, that they should not have a voice in this uh, operation. That's what, that's what you know, caused it because they had so much money to put in to, to her campaign. And we got so much misinformation about Jake Tonko. And, and you know, it was the 400,000 and we see it. You know, it's the same thing with Mayor Licardo. And then the last thing to say, well, Mayor Licardo's campaign with his um, special interests of, of the SVO and Carl Gardino, so, and the, all those, those things. That needs to really stop. And, and they are responsible. Those people are taking and serving their masters, which is the corporations. So we can't say that, that you guys are, are neutral about it because it's not. It's built into the system as we see. And they're voting. It's, it, it's called quid pro quo. You, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You know you're getting money from them. And the last thing is, is because of our climate crisis, the, what, what um, Hank Paulson is telling us, who's the head of um, you know, Goldman Sachs, is we can't have the politicians be the ones because they have their jobs. That's the problem. So we need to be having the scientists lead us and the engineers as we face the abyss. Thank you, Tessa. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. And uh, just a shout out to Jake. It's uh, good to hear you, Jake, on this, on this phone call. I was, that really pissed me off. What, uh, what what happened with Jake? I had never backed a politician in my life, but I believe in, in I believe in this man, and I really hope that you run again. You run again, I will back your play to the full because I believe in, in principally in what he stands for. And and I saw the, and and, bec and there was a lot of other people that did as well. That's why they backed the. That's why they threw all that money at him because they knew that he was a principal. So that aside. This right here, uh, thank you, Councilman uh, Jimenez, for, for putting this on the table, because right here is where the corruption is going to start. I was listening to that whole presentation. The, <laughs> the, the rich rigged the game. So all the rules thereafter that flow from that, those aren't laws. Those are the rules that they put in place because they rigged the game. What they're saying is this, is that money is a voice, like it's a person. But you see, the Constitution does not apply to money. Why? Because you could put 
a person in jail. You can't put money in jail. So it's an uneven way of distribution in, within the context of the application of the Constitution. The Constitution cannot apply to both man and money. Why? Because you could put a man in jail. That's the full weight of the Constitution on him because he's violated it. You can't do that with money. And so there is the split. Why this is illogical to some people, I don't know. But that's what money does. Money corrupts the value system. And it corrupts the moral. It corrupts the principle. And it corrupts the integrity and the dignity of the office, which the office is a representative of the people, not the business. Google coming here is just going to corrupt the entire system. And then it's going to infect it with itself, like a disease, like a virus. And it's going to be money that's going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey Buchanan. Uh, Mayor and Council, uh, good evening. Uh, Jeffrey Cannon with Working Partnerships. I want to thank staff and, and Professor uh, Hasten uh, for the very, I think, detailed presentation. Uh, I think that that definitely sets up the conversation that while this is a, a legally constrained area of policy, that in fact there are there are pretty important avenues that this council can can look at to be able to increase faith in government uh, and particularly to deal with issues around corruption or the appearance of corruption. I think the, uh, that appellate court decision in Blumen, you know, which was signed by you know, now Justice Kavanaugh, uh, gives us some, some hope that uh, the one area where independent expenditures could be reined in uh, would be around uh, foreign influence corporations' contributions to uh, independent expenditure funds. Uh, we've seen already in Seattle through the, the Clean uh, Campaigns Act uh, what a successful model of, of such a policy could look like to constrain uh, at least those individuals uh, or those individual corporations that meet uh, ownership thresholds uh, from uh, taking part in that activity. Uh, and also, I think the, the portions of the presentation discussing, uh, again, around uh, mitigating uh, corruption or the appearance of corruption, uh, crafting policies that limit uh, contributions by uh, corporations with conflicts of interest from uh, donating to candidates uh, seem like within the realm of uh, policy that we've seen the courts uphold to date. Similarly, many large cities in California have public uh, financing policy. Uh, certainly, it's worth exploration what which of the two kind of uh, uh, predominant models make the most sense uh, for San Jose and, and thinking about the budgetary implications. Uh, but the matching system or that democracy voucher system, I think both uh, would be very helpful in terms of uh, creating political equity. Obviously, we couldn't uh, term it that way it, as, as the, the good professor. Thank you. Adrian Gonzalez. Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Gonzalez, and I'm chair of the Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices for the City of San Jose. I'm here today to voice support for Council Member, Council Member Jimenez's memo. Attached to today's agenda, you'll also find a supplemental memo from the board, which outlines in more detail our initial observations of the Council Member's original memo from November. Uh, to summarize, the Council Member has brought forth significant proposals to enhance reporting requirements for independent and candidate controlled committees, to rehaul the city's online resources, to make campaign finance information more accessible to the public, and to pilot a public finance program for city elections. A seeing that the city administration has not yet compiled formal research analyzing the operational implications of these proposals, the city council should not remove any of these items from consideration without first dedicating staff time to reach out to stakeholders and to conduct substantive research. At the board's last meeting on April 7th, we unanimously approved a motion to direct our independent evaluator to assist us with ongoing policy referrals, including items referred from the July 2020 ballot measure discussions. With additional support from city management, the board is happy to collaborate with city admin to support the research needed for council member Jimenez's memo, including using established rapport with campaign finance stakeholders and other municipal ethics commissions to assist with industry best practice and peer benchmarking research. The board also has tentative plans to coordinate with the charter review commission so that as we analyze these policy referrals, we can help to route which are best addressed through the ordinance code, administrative policy, or which should be integrated with the work of the Charter Review Commission. We hope the City Council approves today's memo and we look forward to working together to make City Hall more transparent 
accountable, and accessible to the people of San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Jose uh, de San Fernando. Well, this is uh, Roland LeBron here. Sorry about that. Um, so first of all, um, thank you, uh, Council Member Jimenez, for bringing this issue um, to Council. This is long overdue. Um, as you know, I come from Europe, and I was shocked when last year I figured out why I was assaulted by a negative Dave Tom uh, Tonko commercial every time I launch a YouTube video. And let me wrap up. In closing, I have a question to the mayor. It's whether there is any legal precedent for construing campaign funding used to destroy an opponent as campaign contributions to the ultimate winner. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, I believe it's Rob Wallet. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Great, um, hello. Uh, thank you to the mayor and the council members for uh, discussing this topic and for hearing me. Um, I am a uh, member and am here representing Code for San Jose, which is a uh, diverse nonprofit, nonprofit volunteer group, group devoted to civic activism. Um, our goals are to work towards uh, making community services transparent, accessible, and equitable. I sent an email to the council members and to the mayor regarding one of our projects, Open Disclosure. This project is dedicated to making campaign finance visualizations for local elections, including for San Jose's uh, local elections uh, possible. This is to empower voters to understand what is going on with the finances and elections. I'm a volunteer with Code for San Jose and the project lead for this project. And I'm here today uh, to ask for a partnership with the city in the direction of this project. Uh, we no saw one item from council member Jimenez's uh, memorandum in, in particular, create a central online location for campaign finance disclosure information. We believe that we are also working towards the same mission and believe that uh, both groups could benefit from a partnership in this direction. We believe in the importance of empowering voters with information, and we hope to uh, empower voters to make the, the most uh, informed decision possible when uh, choosing their uh, candidates in the election. Our hope is that we could establish either a biweekly or a monthly meeting associated and associated project demos with um, either council members, ethics committee members, city staff members, or any other interested parties. Thank you for your time and for discussing this important topic. Thank you. Uh, uh, Haiwan, welcome. Yes, thank you, Mayor Licardo. Hi, my name is Hawad Haider. I'm a lifelong resident of District 1, and I'm the former campaign manager for Jake Tonkel's San Jose City Council District 6 campaign. I support Councilmember Jimenez's memo for many reasons, but today I will list five of them. The first reason is the South Bay Tech Hosting website is really bad. Navigating the forms is difficult. It's impossible even. And with all of the spending going on, especially in the late stages of an election cycle, it's so hard to know who's spending against you, who's spending for you, because there are just hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent, and the voters can't even know. Reason number two, the disclosures on political like um, ads and mail pieces are not clear as it stands now. I mean, you can see who funded a piece, but the average voter is not going to understand how that affects uh, what is being stated, and there's no reason why people have to be truthful, why PACs have to be truthful, and that's a huge ethical uh, issue. Number three, we have conflicts of interest going on right now with donors who are donating to you all. I don't say this like, you know, to insult you or undermine you, but those conflict of interests are not ethical either. Number four, matching funds is a pretty good idea. I mean, the professor gave a great presentation um, it seems to be doable legally. Uh, we should study it and think about it. It multiplies the impacts of small donors, which are so important because those are average everyday people in San Jose. Number five, the BFCPP or the Ethics Commission 
Um, it doesn't have resources right now to do the job that it needs to do. I think it's just barely getting by. Other cities fund an entire ethics office and we don't have that. So these are all just reasons that we need a more vibrant and a more strong democracy in San Jose. So please help us get there. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Sebastian, we're not able to hear you right now. We can we're typing. We can't actually hear your voice. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, uh, sorry about that. My name is Sebastian Wong. I am a San Jose native, uh, and I also used to work on Jake Tonko's campaign. Um, I'm speaking in support of council members uh, Jimenez uh, memo. Um, I think the topic of campaign finance actually speaks to the danger of eroding trust in the public with the elected officials. Um, when the memo was first introduced, council members from both sides of the labor business divide complained about both attack ads from independent expenditures, opposing them, and even the lack of control of the messaging of the ones that supported them. Um, not only will this stop, but it also brings up another point. The, the mayor and the council members are consistently uh, have their motivations for their decisions questioned and scrutinized because of the PACs that have supported them. Uh, I think the answer is quite simple. We stop the PAC money from infiltrating our elections and the public gains trust in the leaderships and decisions that you all make. Transparency is also key. In light of the George Floyd verdict, one of the, much of the attention has came onto the San Jose Police Force. Um, our own San Jose Police Association PAC has been one of the voices that was perpetuating a lot of untruths in the last election cycle. And even in February, they were fined for an FPC, FPPC violation for a missing disclosure. But then, even then, the fine had no teeth. It was 149 bucks and 1% of the ad buy. And this type of behavior must stop if the public is going to gain trust in the elections and the elected officials in their decisions. I strongly, strongly would hope that you guys would support Councilmember Jimenez's memo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Gavin Kinlan? Hi. I also wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Jimenez for proposing this because we do indeed have a very classist system. In 2018, in each of the con three contested races, the candidate who raised the most money won the, the election. And because we are in a classist system and due to financial privilege and the racial wealth gap, this also creates a racist electoral system. Contributions from Majority white, minority Hispanic, and more affluent zip codes were higher on average than contributions from majority uh, minority and majority Hispanic and lower income zip codes. And also uh, the presenters did mention that there is an, like an exception for uh, preventing foreign money from getting into the campaigns, but I'd be interested in, to see if there's any measures that could be done to prevent non-San Jose money from getting into San Jose city elections because most of the money in San Jose elections did not come from San Jose in 2018. So city residents provided just 39% of the funds received by candidates during the 2018 election cycle. Thank you. All the, uh, all the information can be cited from professor and court, former council member Ken Yeager. Thank you. Neil Park McClintock. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I wanted to speak in support of item 3.6. Uh, similar to Hawad, I was also a campaign manager last election cycle, not in San Jose, but for J.R. Fruin and Cupertino. Uh, we got a lot of accusations of having dirty campaign finances and all sorts of baseless accusations. And to me, this is actually a benefit for candidates and for current council members. Uh, it's to, it helps provide legitimacy in our elections and helps also provide proof when there are in fact valid campaign finances. Um, none of us like to think that we are beholden to special interests. I'm sure certainly many politicians are at the local level, but if you are looking to make that clear to the public, supporting this memo is a great choice moving forward. Thanks so much. Thank you, Emily Ann Ramos. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, welcome. Wonderful. 
thank you for to council for taking this up. The first presentation was a bit of a bucket of depressing cold water for those of us who really believe in the power people have to make a difference in government that's truly by the people, of the people, and for the people. But looking at Councilmember Jimenez's memo, we do see some avenues to move forward. So let's get the disclosure requirements in. One thing to think about also with disclosure requirements is the ability of ads to target specific groups with misinformation, which is why it's important to require campaigns to submit what they are sending out to a central place with the city. Um, thankfully, seem to be the safer of the options when we are facing um, possible litigations. We should also put more teeth in our enforcement we will have a lot of ideas thrown around in this study session. And the most important thing is that we move forward with actions that, are, that will restore trust in our local government. So thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you for, for hopefully future actions that you will take. Um, and I look forward to seeing what will come out of this study session. Please move forward, uh, Council Member Jimenez's memo. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Veronica. Great. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to the council for bringing this again. Um, such a very important issue um, as we move forward and as we move uh, with transparency and inclusion and equity in our council, in our city as well. And just like previous speakers, I also want to make sure that there's transparency and that the study sessions are open to the public and are in languages that, um, that our city um, residents feel comfortable and feel uh, they can understand. Um, with that being said, also just the distribution of any flyers, the distribution of anything should also be translated um, in advocacy of equity and advocacy of transparency as well. Um, and just like previous speakers have said, there should be some accountability towards what um, what candidates are putting out there. There should be something that they need to submit before they send it out. Because many of the times, as we've noticed, um, it's not reliable information and um, or really targeting a person on um, the person itself rather than, than their actions um, or who they are. So definitely um, we need to have some kind of accountability because there's none right now. Um, and again, as we move forward, I want to make sure and advocate that we have the languages uh, uh, that and that we have that transparency with our whole community and that we engage them into this study session and not just we say, oh, we're going to engage them and we actually don't do much to engage them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Ma. Afternoon council. I like many of the speakers agree that most of the items, all of the items in the Jimenez memo should continue going forward with the city. After all, making sure that the election process is transparent and acceptable to everyone increases the legitimacy of general governance in the city. Specifically, I want to point out this, this recommendation D, which is to put the uh, Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices directly into the charter. Currently, it is only created by ordinance, which means that by a vote of six in any council meeting, it could just be completely dissolved. And we should really put it in the charter to make sure it has the independence to be able to run its operations in a way that everyone can agree can be permanent. I also agree that the board should have the resources necessary to pull out its duties. There might not be a lot of complaints right now because people might think it's not a very effective body. And when we see other cities like Sacramento, San Diego have their bodies with full staff, with full funding, like if we want to become a leadership in this space, we need to put the money and the actions to make sure we do so. Um, inherently, we want to make sure that also the system that we find all the campaign disclosure forms are in a properly formatted system. The current system seems really hacky in a weird, you know, third party website mid 2000s kind of UI. And inherently that's a barrier for anyone to try to figure out, hey, where is this weirdly named pack coming and IE money coming from? Because we all know the IE names are all going to be somewhat bland, somewhat you know, plain, but inherently the information behind the packs are very important to anyone who's trying to make a decision in the midst of their busy lives. So I suggest the council would look into that very carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Angel Martinez.
Um, okay, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I hope everybody's doing well. And can I, am I being heard okay? Yeah, we can hear you fine, Brian. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think it's really, really important that we do finance, campaign finance reform. I don't think public uh, voting and stuff should be have any private finance myself. But that's too far down the road. There's just been too much chicanery, not a, not saying any one person or anything, but it's a system. You, 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 you're, you're having people who have money have more influence than people who don't have money. That's the local, regional, state, and federal level international level to some degree. There are people in this community who can pick up the phone and talk to any person at any level almost instantaneously. Then there's people like us, you know, just normal citizens who can pick up the phone and be on hold. Um, and that is not equal access. And the one thing, the only thing that buys that access is money. Unfortunately, money buys pretty much everything. Um, and I'm sad to say, I didn't used to believe that. I don't believe that about individuals, but I'm talking about systems. Um, and I must say that the Councilperson Jimenez's uh, memo was really good to put that forward. And also, it looks like the um, um, California Public Utilities Commission actually held PG&E accountable. I literally almost passed out. So maybe it does work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Martinez? Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can. Uh, thank you. So good evening, council members. My name is Angel Martinez and I am the current president of the Silicon Valley Young Democrats. The measure of a successful democracy is its ability to ensure a transparent election and being able to see who is spending on what race is therefore essential to public trust and honest public discourse. As we saw in the last election, toxic campaign practices and misleading campaign ads work to diminish distrust and harm the integrity of our local elections for future campaigns. As Councilmember Jimenez states in his memo, the city has already enacted strong regulations capping contributions to candidates for office and to candidates controlled committees. However, there are very few regulations for independent expenditures made by political committees not controlled by a candidate. Because of this, and in order to rebuild public trust in our city's elections, I encourage the council today to support Councilmember Jimenez's memo and allow for the creation of a pilot program that will allow for public financing of elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let me turn now to uh, the council. Uh, appreciate all of the public input as well as um, the information we've received from our attorneys, as well as Mark and as well as uh, the, our expert, um, uh, Professor Hassan. I'm sorry, have I mispronounced that, Professor? It's hey. Hassan. Yeah, you got it right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, I just had one question about the proposal, the set of proposals that uh, are authored by Councilman Jimenez. Um, if you scroll down to 2C, um, the 2C2, the, the requirement of recusal is actually something I, I proposed last year. I'm happy to support that to avoid conflicts of interest. But 2C1 specifically prohibits categories of donors like landlords, for example, or contractors from making contributions. And I'm wondering if you have any view about the constitutionality of limiting categories of people from being able to contribute. Is, is that directed to me? Yes. So the Supreme Court has never weighed in on this question. Uh, lower courts have upheld some provisions, for example, uh, limiting lobbyists or limiting lobbyists from contributing during legislative sessions. Uh, some uh, courts have upheld limits, for example, on preventing gaming interests from contributing to a gaming commission. And right. then there are other court decisions that are uh, that go the other way. And so this is one of those issues where uh, you can't say off the top of your head whether it would be constitutional or not. It would require some research. And it, I would suggest it would require some very careful drafting before anything in particular would be enacted to make sure that it uh, maximizes the chances of it being upheld in case it is challenged uh, in a future court proceeding. Okay. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that information. And do you, 
uh, I, I assume federal law already prohibits foreign entities and persons from contributing to local elections. Uh, I, I see what the proposal, I think, from Councilman Menes relates to some threshold for entities which have some share of federal ownership. I assume, assume that would be perfectly fine, right? So a uh, federal law provides uh, for limits on certain foreign individuals, companies, and governments providing um, uh, either contributions or spending. The issue is how do you determine when an entity is foreign? So for example, if you have a company that is headquartered in the United States, but all of the shareholders or most of the shareholders are foreign nationals, how does that count? There are some federal election commission rulings uh, and, and rules that apply in federal elections, uh, but those wouldn't necessarily be uh, the same rules that could be adopted by a state or a locality. So there certainly is room for discussion about where the line is to figure out what counts as a foreign entity. Right. Okay, so I understand that's going to require some analysis. Uh, can I go back for just a moment to the, to the 2C1? The way it's framed is limit corporations with conflicts of interest. Um, but you know, I certainly know many of these entities that are engaged may be limited partnerships. Um, they may be sole proprietorships. They may be other. They may be uh, other forms of entities. Um, just wondering, under the, whatever scrutiny is applied here. Does it make sense that you would allow, would, would a court uphold saying corporations shall not, but if you happen to have a real estate limited partnership, you can? Yeah, so I think one way of understanding this is what, what you're making is kind of like an equal protection argument. You know, why would you single out this group rather than that group? And the way the courts typically approach this, and again, I haven't researched this particular question. Um, is that they would ask, well, does the particular group that's singled out pose a greater danger of corruption? So for example, if there's a history of um, you know, um, a scandal involving real estate developers, then maybe a city would have a greater reason to single out those individuals rather than others. This is an area, again, where the Supreme Court has never weighed in and the lower courts have reached different conclusions. And a lot of it is very specific to both the record that is created by the jurisdiction that passes the law, as well as the particular court that resolves the question. And so it's really important that whatever law is passed, that there is a good record of showing what the problem is. Uh, that is a, a generally, if we're talking about a limitation, you're talking about a corruption or appearance of corruption problem. It can't be an equality problem, which as I mentioned is off the table. So you have to create the best record possible that would explain why, if you're going to single out only certain entities, why you think those entities create a greater danger of corruption. Okay. Okay, well, I, I certainly um, appreciate the many of the ideas here and support all the ideas that are in, under the first paragraph um, and third paragraph. I would suggest if we're going to continue to study all these, I would, I'd suggest a friendly amendment to whoever makes the motion to include bans on gifts to elected officials. I think that would be uh, helpful to consider as well. Um, and perhaps also to planning commissioners or others who sit in positions of decision-making authority. Um, I have some concerns um, about 2A, about the extent to which we have taxpayer funding particularly given our very, very challenged city budget and the fact that we already have the most thinly staffed city hall of any big city in the country and we're not providing enough services to take some of that money to actually spend on elections, uh, on campaigns specifically for politicians. I think a lot of taxpayers and residents will understandably have a lot of concerns about that. So I have a lot of concerns. Um, I also have concerns about the conflict of interest provisions specifically relating to donations from some people, but not from others. Um, you know, the last time an elected official in this city was indicted, it had to do with both a garbage contract and a union, for example. Unions aren't mentioned here. Um, 
I think recusal is something I strongly support and a mandatory recusal is a sensible approach. It's one I've recommended in the past, but deciding that only folks who may be ideologically on one side can't give, but the other folks on the other side can give, even though, uh, for example, unions are involved in very large contracts with the city, in fact, our largest expenditures. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm concerned about the way that it, it seems to be unbalanced. And I would only support something that was much more balanced. Uh, and I think it's getting into probably some dangerous territory anyway. It's probably easily addressed simply by mandating recusal from anyone who's received a contribution over the prior 12 months from that entity. Good Mayor, I'm just, uh, you finished up a little quicker than I expected. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna go on camera, give me a sec. Well, one, I, I would just say that uh, I very much appreciate your comments. I appreciate your questions to the professor. I think they're timely. I, I uh, you know, th this is, uh, these recommendations, as you see in the memo, uh, they're, they've evolved, obviously. We submitted a substitution, a substitute memo, but uh, really, as I see it, we're, uh, we're throwing things against the wall, seeing what fits. I, I, do, I do agree that, uh, that whatever we pass needs to be equitable to all folks that are involved in these processes. And so that is, that is part of sort of what's important to me and some of the other folks in the Brown Act, and we've actively talked about that. And so I appreciate your comments on adding language. I wasn't quite clear as to where, what, where you were referring to as, as it relates to the recusal and where the language you think can be clear. Was it? Uh... Oh, no, yeah, I, I support the recusal, which is this 2C2. Oh, okay, okay. That, and, and so I, I suggested that perhaps that could be, you know, I know it's not a complete safeguard, but a pretty good safeguard about conflicts. Yeah, yeah, and that's why, at least in the substitute memo that we submitted, a replacement memo, that was ex it actually uses the word recusal. Um, right. Or even maybe we can even add the word disclosure as well, right? Because disclosing is obviously important as well. And I think that's, I was looking at the California code that we cite there, and uh, it also says disclosure there. Uh, so so anyway, I appreciate that. Be, be happy to add uh, the banning on gifts and, and expanding that to planning commissioners and other folks that really play an important role in, in many of the things we do here at the city. Uh, so thank you for that. I, I'm not gonna make a motion quite yet. Uh, I do just wanna make some comments and then have a, uh, a few questions for the professor. Uh, Mr. Hassan, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. And uh, wanna say thank you to, to, to Mark and Adrian and all the folks from the public that uh, joined us today to be able to share their concerns and, and support. Um, and really what I would like to say is that the driving, uh, force behind these ideas are really is my attempt to express via the memos uh, and now the replacement memos you have all seen is uh, really that we strive to provide transparency in all we do but uh, uh, uniquely important to me is that having transparency in the space of elections and, and uh, I think that our you all would agree that our constituents deserve it and quite frankly desire it um, and I believe that the recommendations in the memo uh, really advance the public interest in fair campaigns uh, practices and move us towards restoring public trust in local elections. Uh, and I know that many of us on this call, uh, obviously elected officials have experienced inaccurate and hurtful attacks. I know Jake was on the call, he was touching a little on that. I've experienced it, many of you have as well. Um, and, and you know, we know what we're getting ourselves into, so it's not a big surprise, uh, but to many voters, unfortunately, they believe what they see and they believe what they read. <laughs> and because of this, I think it really creates a, uh, uh, toxic campaign practices that really diminish the public trust and so uh, and, and integrity in the public in the elections and so that was one of the reasons that we did all this or that I did all this my team and I along with the folks in the Brown Act um, you know last election cycle just to throw out some numbers and your for your advocation mr. professor Hassan is uh, you know there, there was uh, there was a lot of money spent in the city of San Jose I just want to read off a few numbers uh, the top uh, contributor was about $588,000 from the SVO, the Chamber of Commerce. Right below that, about $430,000 from the Labor Council, South Bay Labor Council. Uh, after that, we had about $380,000 from Innovation for All. Um, and then we had uh, the San Jose Police Officers Association with $231,000. And so obviously there's a lot of interest, a lot of players <laughs> from diverse sort of spaces in the political world. And so... That's why I think this conversation is so important because it crosses party lines, uh, you know, party affiliation, 
uh, business interests, labor interests. And that, that's why I thought it was important to bring this forward. And, and I hope we can move something forward to uh, sort of bridge the gap between what's happening, the perception by the residents, uh, and, and what we think it should be as it relates to disclosures and things of, the, things of that nature. And so uh, after saying all that, what, what I'd like to do is ask you just a few questions, uh, Mr. Hassan. I don't know if you had a chance to quickly review the memo. I know a lot's there. Um, so I do apologize, but what I was wondering is, 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 before I ask you what your thoughts are on the memo or some of the ideas in there is, do you, you know, I'm not sure as a professor, if you're in the, you're in the space in which you're advocating particular things that are better than others or things of that nature, but are there like packages of good governance sort of things that we can move forward as it relates to elections that you think are, are, are uh, evolving or common practices and jurisdiction that you think are worthwhile move, in moving forward? Is there anything that comes to mind? Well, so, you know, the first thing I'd say is that, um, you know, I thought I was brought primarily here to express a view on the constitutionality or just explain the basic constitutional issues. And, and I literally got the memo in the middle of this meeting. So I didn't have a chance to, I can't give you a constitutional opinion about specific, and of course you don't have language there. So I can just speak generally. Yes, I am you. someone who advocates reasonable campaign finance regulations, especially disclosure. I filed briefs in the United States Supreme Court supporting various federal disclosure rules. I think it's important to you know, learn from other cities. San Jose is not the only city in California that's a large city that has enacted reform. So sometimes it's not necessary to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and you, know, you can look at what they're doing in Oakland or San Francisco or Los Angeles or Sacramento or San Diego, all of these places have adopted different, everyone's dealing with the same problem, large outside spending, a lot of it not disclosed, um, uh, outside groups that sometimes come in and, and swamp voters with misleading ads and you know, people are fed up and you, know, you have to kind of think about how you address these problems within the constitutional framework that the Supreme Court has put forward. And so, Speaking generally, disclosure rules have been pretty well accepted. The more cl closely they're tied to, to candidates getting money, the easier it is to get them upheld. The case that's before the United States Supreme Court now involves trying to regulate nonprofits, and you know, lots of money flows into outside undisclosed groups. And so, you know, it's sometimes a question of cat and mouse. How do you construct a law that's actually effective? And California, at the state level, the FPPC, they're actually a national leader in crafting laws that are actually effective in disclosing who the top contributors are. So all of that stuff is pretty, you know, there's a lot that has been mined there. Um, uh, uh, same thing with conflict of interest laws. Uh, and, um, you know, where I live in Los Angeles, you know, there's a debate over regulating uh, real estate developers and whether they could be limited in making contributions, the same kinds of issues arise. So I would suggest you know, you have your city attorney, look at what other city attorneys are doing, compare notes. And, and also, if you want to do something innovative, I would suggest studying the voucher plan. I first proposed campaign finance vouchers back in 1996. I was one of the first people in the modern era that said this is a good thing. And I was very glad to see that, um, uh, that Seattle is experimenting with it. And so now we're getting some data about how well it's working. And I think, you know, thinking of creative ways of using market-based mechanisms to get voters involved are, are smart ways to, to go forward. Yeah, thank you for that. I especially appreciate you mentioning the fact that uh, we should look at what other folks are doing. Uh, you know, I, I, and to that end, I wish I could tell you all the ideas in the memo were original and we just came up with, <laughs> but the reality is that uh, we, were, we were combing sort of the landscape to see what other cities was do were doing. And, uh, as you and the mayor were talking about some of the, or he was asking questions about uh, the um, issues related to foreign influence committees and things of that nature. I mean, Seattle just passed something in January, I believe, in which uh, that, that's where we got, I got that idea from. And so, um, okay, well, very, thank you very much for those comments. I appreciate it. And, and, you know, I apologize that you weren't, in, you know, I didn't plan to ask you questions about the memo, but I, I just thought I'd just, you know, throw that out there. So my apologies if you felt blindsided, but there was no expectation that you would. No, no apology necessary. So long as I'm not asked to give a, a, a constitutional opinion. I'm yeah, no, not at all. Not at all. Informal opinion at, at that uh, is, is. And the other thing that I realize is that as we go forward with this, uh, you know, when we're drafting these recommendations, it's often the case that, uh, at least in my mind, do we do we send something forward before the full council that's fully baked? Or do we send sort of recommendations in which smarter people than, than me, than many of us 
in the city attorney's office can draft something uh, and do a lot of the work behind the scenes and make sure what we're doing is, is legal. Um, and that's what I hope takes place in this instance is that uh, the city attorney's office goes back and, and really thinks about uh, how to do this appropriately. And, and you know, I, I value your opinion, Nora, and your staff's opinion, Mark's opinion. And so that's what I hoping, I'm, I'm hoping takes place. And so uh, with that, I, I understand there's gonna be more conversations uh, to be had on this as we go through this meeting. So I'll just move the memorandum as it is, uh, knowing that we're gonna have a conversation about it and forsake a conversation. Uh, so I, I'd appreciate a second if possible. Second. Second, uh, Council, Council Member Reyes, uh, second, okay. Um, and Council Reyes, would you consider also including the um, potential ban on gifts? Yeah, Mayor, sorry if I missed that. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Council Member Cohen? Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Councilmember Jimenez for leading on this. Um, he's always humble and says smarter people than him, but there's very few people on the council that I think are smarter than Councilmember Jimenez. And, and so I'm glad that he's uh, looked into these issues and, um, and uh, brought this memo forward. Um, just for some context, also on that money that you mentioned from before, that, that all those dollar amounts were spent just in basically two races last year. That wasn't a situation where we had five contested races and a mayor's race in the same election. So that total of $1.2 million or whatever it is was spent in just two this same council districts. And so it's, it's, it was actually staggering uh, amounts of money. Um, what, what's, hap and what's been happening for years, and I think what's getting worse and worse, is that the independent expenditure um, spending is drowning out the voice of direct voice of candidates. And that's what's most frustrating to me, and I think what's frustrating to our constituents is they don't know who they're hearing from and who's who's actually behind a lot of the messages they're getting. And candidates are unable to sort of control their own message and then compete on their merits against one another. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, and, and and in fact, what ends up happening is that situation ends up necessitating that candidates raise more money on their own in order to try to get their message out and be in somewhat some control of their message. Um, and so it's. It's an unfortunate situation. I know, based on what we've heard, obviously we can't we can't limit, we can't stop um, independent expenditures, we can't stop groups from spending as much as they want to try to influence the election and say whatever they want about about candidates. Um, but that's why transparency is so crucial, and we don't have enough transparency of of who's putting money into those independent expenditures. And so, I wholeheartedly support the the, the disclosure parts of the memo that um, talk about. The, the, you know, making sure that we have a clearinghouse for getting information out about who's spending the money. I know that there are state reporting requirements for IEs, but it's really hard for anybody to navigate that and find out information. So having the city um, have a place where we are keeping track of who is spending and who is donating to these groups will make a big difference, I think, in how the public um, sees these, sees these uh, messages. Um, it's also a little, you know, I know this is a bit outside the scope of this memo and probably not for today's conversation, but it's an interesting thing to me how strict the rules are in San Jose for candidates and what candidates can do on their own. Um, because given the, the, the unbalanced now nature of what independent expenditures are doing and what candidates are doing, um, some of the rules make it even harder for candidates to rise above the noise of the independent expenditures. And, you know, it's been, it's something for me to explore in the future is why is it that San Jose has its own layer of, of election uh, implementation that other cities don't have? Why are our, our expenditure limits so much lower and, and more restrictive than any of the other cities and the jurisdictions in Santa Clara County? Um, makes it hard. And I know that you know, we try to take money out of politics and make, make, make it appear that candidates are less uh, influenced, but What's happening is the, as a result is that it's, I think, flipped in the other direction. We're more influent, or there's a perception of more influence because of all the money the independent groups are spending that's less accountable than the money the candidates are spending. Um, for that reason, I'm a little bit concerned for a different reason than the mayor, but with um, item 2C1. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot we can do to improve transparency and um, funding of elections. And I'm a little concerned about also throwing in anything that would limit the ability of candidates to raise money directly. Um, while I think that transparency and that it, it exists and, we, and I think it makes sense to have that transparency and recusal in cases that a potential conflict of interest that I think will help um, you know, 
resolve some of these situations where there might be a perceived conflict of interest, making it harder for candidates to raise money in the context of what we're seeing with independent money um, is, doesn't, isn't the right approach, at least I don't feel is the right approach. Um, the other thing I wanna mention, public financing. Um, I, I do believe in public financing. I've been a, a supporter of the idea for a long time. I know it's a challenging question. Obviously, it's a tough one in, in, in how you fund it and what the what the fiscal effects are and what the public thinks of it. But I definitely support exploring it and seeing what we can find out about what it would cost, what it would take, what what kind of models we could use that would at least give um, some help to candidates and also encourage those small donations um, and more fundraising, more small donor fundraising from from candidates. So um, I will I do believe that we should. Keep that in as something to explore. Um, so I think that that that's those are my those are all my comments. My you know my proposal would be to I, I would vote for the memo if we remove two C one, um, but everything else I'd like to see explored and pursued further by the city. Thank you, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Mayor and uh, Councilor Jimenez. Just want to thank you for the thoughtful memo and outlining all these different sub issues. And I think it's an important conversation for us to have. And you know, I'll say I, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time over the years thinking about these issues because I founded a technology startup many years ago that was focused on helping voters basically band together and organize their votes and their small dollar donations as a counterweight to to big dollar spending in politics. And so I've thought a lot about these dynamics over the years. And, and I, I think all the items here are worthy of, of discussion. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to support the memo as is. I, I did want to highlight a couple of, of thoughts um, that are similar, I think, to Council Member Cohen's comments. Um, one is that personally, I am really a big fan of transparency and disclosure requirements, because I think they are the most likely to be uh, implemented in a, in a kind of even, fair, equitable manner. I think they're, they're kind of, they're straightforward rules of the game. Um, they're most likely to be upheld and not run afoul of constitutional concerns. Um, and, and I think it, it just, you know, I really believe sunlight is the best disinfectant as the saying goes, and that if the public really understands who's raising what from where, who's spending what, it, you know, we're all just better informed and that that's the kind of simplest, fairest, easiest way to improve public engagement and public trust. So very supportive of that set of rules. I think the thing I want, the other thing I wanted to know, which I think Councilor Cohen was, was getting at, um, you know, precisely the same way is that my observation over the last, you know, looking back over what's now, I'm sure, you know, many decades of these kinds of rules is that because what we can regulate is contributions to candidates, oftentimes what government regulates then or puts restrictions on is what candidates can raise and do. And I think that's appropriate to, to an extent, but I think as Councilor Cohen said, my, my only concern there, I think we should continue the conversation and explore it and research it and really uh, you know, go through a vetting process. But my concern would be the relative power of the groups that were listed. So um, Councilor Jimenez listed SVO, Labor Council, um, Innovation, the Innovation for All PAC, and then um, and I think POA as the floor. And you know, in a, in a political ecosystem, the more that we make it hard for candidates to raise money, which tends to be the most accountable and transparent money, the more in a rel on a relative basis that I think we allow outside independent groups to have power in the system. And they have fewer rules and there are fewer rules we can apply. So I just am very cognizant of that. I, just, I think even the best sounding law that I would, you know, want to support if it's giving a lot of relative power to outside groups that are less accountable, less transparent, and make and really hamstringing candidates, I worry overall about the health of the, the ecosystem, which is why, again, I think transparency and disclosure is, is the, the best way to go. Um, and then I guess the only other thing I'll add at this point, and it's, you know, it's a question I've said, I'll, I'll support the motion. I guess the only thing that would make me feel a little better about the way that it's worded would be, um, Councilmember Jimenez, if you were amenable to just broadening out the, the subject of item 2C where it says limit corporations, I think the mayor made this point. It just seems to me, I mean, of the four groups that you listed, which I know that was outside expenditures, but I don't think any one of those four is, is, a, is, a, is actually 
legally a corporation. I think they're, you know, political entities and, and or unions or, or whatnot. And so, you know, when you look at where a lot of the power lies, it's not necessarily just within corporations. And there are a lot of different legal entities. So I just, I just hope that the spirit of that, at least, is that we're looking at them all and we're really considering the whole basket of external entities that influence the political process. So I don't know if you'd be amenable to a, a broader term there, but I, it would certainly make me feel better about voting for it. Uh, I guess I would ask what term you think would be most appropriate to use in order. I, you know, I, I think um, entity or organization, I, I'm sorry, I'm bringing your memo back up. I don't, um, and if anyone else has a, has a great thought on this, I'm, I'm open to it. It just says limit corporations, which just, at least legally is very narrow. And so, you know, li limit entities or um, limit, limit um, corporations and other entities with conflicts of interest from donating to candidates. I, I just, I would prefer at this stage when we're kind of exploring and researching and gonna have a follow-up conversation that we just direct staff to stay broad and think about the range of entities that influence our elections. And if that was the spirit of this, great. It's just the wording is very narrow. Oh, council member, I think you're muted. That is the spirit of it. And I am amenable to making changes. I, I guess what I, I would like to, is it okay if we go through the list of folks, get sure. comments on it, and then we'll get that, we'll go back to that and see if maybe we come up with a different sort of variation of that. But uh, sure. Yeah. But, I, but I'm open to that. That was the spirit of it. Okay, great. Thank you. That sounds good. And uh, Mayor, that's all I have. Okay. So the friendly amendment is tabled for a moment. We'll come back to it. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, um, Council Member Jimenez for your, um, your memo. Anybody that's ever been through a campaign knows that the whole system is out of whack. So um, particularly the areas around uh, more transparency, I think um, are, are positive. Um, I have some uh, concerns and actually they were raised uh, previously uh, in terms of um, your item uh, C1. And, and that concern is wouldn't we, in effect, be moving that money to the, to the, the IEs if we implement uh, limitations on, on campaign contributions to candidates? I mean, effectively, we've seen that happen in the past. And I, I just imagine that, you know, your item one, uh, C1 would further uh, create, you know, that, that process from taking place and, and maybe even accelerating it. So. My, my first question to you is on your um, item two, uh, where you say um, to direct staff to return to council with options for new um, regulations. Uh, I just want to get more clarity in, in terms of is your intent to have staff come back and provide us with a, a suite of options, you know, based on some of the feedback that we provide today, and then we would, you know, vote on, you know, which options we we want to accept and which ones we want to re reject. I just want to just understand your vision of what, what your memo wants to accomplish. Yeah, I, I think that is correct in, in assuming that. It's uh, that they would take what's in this memo, the comments that they're hearing, go back, slap something together, <laughs> and bring it back for us. And then we, I, I envision having another conversation, clarifying things, tweaking things, and then, and then moving, moving in that direction. So. Yeah, that is what I see. And the, and the other thing that, uh, you know, because I know uh, C1 has come up a few times. And so I understand uh, the comments around maybe displacing some of that money. Essentially, it gets shifted elsewhere. I, I guess maybe the language isn't as, as, as precise as it should be. But I guess in my mind, what I was thinking is, you know, so I'll, let me just read the language. So, so it says prohibit proposing the Fair Elections Initiative 2020 to prohibit donations from donors, including their lobbyists seeking large city contracts or discretionary or approval of planning and land use decisions and large developments. I guess in my mind, I'm thinking if someone has something before us that they couldn't give money, it wouldn't necessarily be an outright ban of ever giving money if, you're, if you have a client that may have something before us in three years, right? Or whatever it may be. And so I'm not sure if that distinction helps alleviate some of the concerns, but at least that was my thinking around it. And again, maybe it wasn't worded as well as it should have been, but uh, that was the thinking around it. Okay, um, I appreciate that, that clarification. Um, and I guess when, we, when, they, uh, when staff comes back with um, 
their recommendations or options. I guess we can have a further discussion, but I, I can tell you that uh, my concerns on one, one is direct, redirecting that money to, to the IEs. And two, if we're gonna move forward with um, that item to be more comprehensive to all the, you know, the special interests that, that have the potential for, for a conflict of interest. And then uh, the last point I wanna make is on the public financing. Um, obviously we have uh, budgetary constraints, but there's also a lot of detail that needs to be fleshed out in terms of you know, who would even qualify to get you know, public financing, because obviously you wanna open up the political process to everyone, but you, you have to have some limitations and, and barriers, otherwise it, it'll be a free for all. So I'm just, I would need to understand more detail and clarity in terms of uh, how that would work, how would, how would it be financed and what kind of parameters would be in place in terms of someone even qualifying for public finance. And, and if I may through the chair, through, 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 the, through you mayor, just so, so I totally agree with you. I mean, we, we didn't flesh out all those details, but what I would say is that's why it's very explicit, explicit in 2A in which we mentioned different cities that are doing some of this work already. Um, so I would hope is that staff would go back and, you know, peel, pull out what Seattle's doing, San Francisco and Oakland's doing, and maybe, maybe uh, create an amalgamation of best practices or things that are working for all of them. And maybe that's something they propose. But yeah, I mean, I don't have any particular uh, sort of formulation as to how it would take place. But, uh, but I think in doing some of the research around what's already being done, I think would be instructive as to how to move forward. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Council Member. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kahn, is your hand up from before? Well, I put it up again, but I, I'm going over. So some of you haven't spoken yet and come back. Okay, Council Member Sparza. Thank you. Um, I, uh, my, uh, my camera's breaking out a little bit. Um, I, Look, I, I appreciate Council Member Jimenez bringing this up. Um, I do have a lot of questions and concerns around public financing. I think um, I think folks have been interested in it for years, um, but it's it's complicated. Um, some cities follow a reimbursement method whereby people still have to raise money. I'm not rich. I don't represent a rich district, rich people. I mean, in general, um, I, you know, the SBO didn't do um, mail for me, <laughs> right? So, um, so, so I look at that, those um, opportunities and I think there's still a lot to figure out. Um, Seattle has a really well thought out or probably the best thought out um, out of the research that I did, but almost half of the money um, set aside for that public financing program went to administration um, because of that. And so that's something we really need to be mindful of and acknowledge as we um, move forward and, and look at what our options really are so that we um, make sure that our intentions are to really lift new voices up. Um, as far as the discussions, um, yeah, I'm not even going to refer to the memo. I, I, you know, I have an issue with, with grouping rich individuals and rich corporations with people that make 20 bucks an hour and many of whom live in my district, by the way. So this is not a hypothetical situation for me at all. Um, who make 20 bucks an hour and are looking for a way to have a voice and a way to compete and, and rise above that. And so um, in the past, you know, typically folks with a lot of money can write a fat check. Um, and let's be really honest, labor has typically been able to, to bring out the volunteers. Um, folks who have that time and that's how they compete. They volunteer their time. They go door to door. Um, we don't coordinate, but by the end of a campaign, you can kind of see each other all over the district. Um, and um, and so, so that's how we compete, right? And if this is really about getting rid of SVO-like mailers with messages showing 
um, showing black people rioting and trying to touch that, touch, trying to appeal to racism and, and fear, then that's what this conversation should really be about. And, and to try and include the voices, like I said, of folks that make 20 bucks an hour and are trying to be heard and trying to think of a level playing field for them and rich corporations and developers who can create a dozen LLCs so that they can, they can um, contribute a dozen times. Let's be really honest about that. The, leving, the playing field is not level. It's not level now. And so, um, so, you know, let's not, they're not equal. And I, I would prefer to include the voices of working people in our city who are desperate to be heard. And no, they're not Google. No, they're not rich developers. So let's give them the voice. Let's not try and pretend that it's equal because it's not. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. I'm sorry, Councilmember Foley. Then we'll go to Councilmember Cohen. <laughs> Thank you. Just a couple of things. First, I just want to disclose an inadvertent Brown Act violation. I uh, neglect. I forgot that I was in a Brown Act, and then I reached out to Councilmember Davis earlier today. Uh, but it, it, trust me, it won't affect my vote one way or the other. I just needed to disclose that, um, Sergio. Once again, in a Brown Act with you, and I completely forgot. I think I have short-term memory problems. I'm not really sure. Um, the other thing is that, you know, we've had, uh, I'm really glad to see this issue come before us. We really do need to have a robust conversation around campaign finance reform, and that's what we're talking about right now. We have all had PACs spend money against us, and they do so uh, in a real hurtful way in, in many ways, whether it's the SVO or it's the POA. They all use tactics that uh, that manipulate the discussion and take the discussion away from the real issues. So this really is uh, about transparency, disclosure. None of us like to raise money for campaigns. I, I would venture that the majority of us do not like to go out and make those phone calls for money. Uh, it's necessary because we have to get our message out there. But when you have PACs that are spending so much money on campaigns and, and their independent expenditures, so we don't have anything to, to do with them, we can't by law, but they are muddling our message. So it is when we're as candidates and we're out knocking on doors and passing out our flyers and meeting with people, and then other organizations are, are out there with messages too, what is a voter to think? Who is a voter to trust? Hopefully, if you can touch enough people as the candidate, they're going to they're going to support you. But there's a lot of noise out there with all the mailers. I know all the money that was spent. Boy, amount, imagine the amount of trees that were destroyed in the mailers that we receive uh, in each campaign. So I'm all, uh, I'm very supportive of campaign finance reform. I think it needs to be across the board though for all entities. And I do like the, get, the idea of limiting gifts and also limiting gifts for uh, planning commission as well because influence can be born at, at that level as well. So with that, I'm, I will uh, conclude my comments, Ben, I, I look forward to the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Rennes. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I have a couple of questions, especially around the motion that's on the floor now. Um, what is the process? Uh, I'm not sure if it's Mark or Nora um, who I should be asking, but what is the process? What is the next step from here on? So if the, the motion gets approved and moves forward, it um, gets fleshed out in your office, comes back, how, how does that look like? That, that's essentially what would happen. Um, it, it appears that um, our office and to the extent we would need to um, 
uh, touch base with staff on on some issues, we would do that and then bring something back. And and we were uh, anticipating using um, the professor as a as a backstop, given his expertise, and and to make sure that um, as we were vetting ideas and going through these memos, that we weren't um, tripping over uh, some constitutional or other issues. Um, I think when this initially came forward um, with uh, Council Member Jimenez, I had indicated that uh, we wanted to retain an expert and, and uh, um, to just help us to make sure that um, uh, there wasn't something we were missing since this is such an important area. So we'll, we'll work on uh, whatever it is that the council directs us to work on and be coming back. Got it. Thank you. And and uh, Nora, what is the um, rule or the guidance, the guideline that we have right now for gifts um, for sitting council members? Because I heard that there was an addition and that was for um, not just, it was for sitting council members and, and commissioners. Um, yes. And Mark, do you want to, uh, can you jump in on that? Yeah, um, no problem. Uh, so the current rule uh, that applies, it, sorry, the, the current rule that applies uh, with the gift ordinance is that uh, council members as well as designated employees can accept the gift of more than fifty dollars. Um, so anything that's fifty dollars or less, you can accept. Um, if it's over fifty dollars, then an exception must apply, uh, and those exceptions are are those that are under state law. Right. Um, so, and that's one of the so. That's one of the questions I have. How would that look like if we move forward with this? And the, re the only reason that I'm asking questions about and not because I get um, all these gifts, but I get tchotchkes, you know, that when we go to an event, we get a t-shirt, we get a mug, we get this. And, and those are really, um, I think for me, very minimal. I've never received a, any a very significant gift um, or have traded for anything in terms of so just to keep transparency um so i'm not sure what we're trying to fix what's the problem have we seen that there has been uh, an increase in gifts that we've reported um that people haven't reported or that have added up to more <coughs> than what the guideline states now and, well, and I, I, I can speak sorry <laughs> okay, no, go, well, Mark, jump into, I don't know that there's a problem. I think the, the question is, should we expand it to other commissioners? Um, and Mark, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, too, with respect to reporting, um, the threshold for reporting gifts on state law is $50. So, um, so long as you're accepting gifts that are less than $50, then there's nothing that will need to be reported. There are some criteria if an exception applies where you need to report it, but um, you know, it, it's not something that, um, you know, I, I, we wouldn't really be able to track because uh, uh, council members and, and designated employees are supposed to be accepting gifts of more than $50. Correct. So the, is the motion, um, uh, the addition to the motion right now, um, a, a complete ban on like tchotchkes, t-shirts? I, I, here's the problem I have with that is that I don't want to fall into a trap by accepting a t-shirt that is a gift to me at a marathon or a Thanksgiving um, turkey trot because it is essentially a gift. Um, and I'd rather not fall, uh, I'd rather not set us up for a trap like that. I have very minimal types of gifts that I receive. Um, I, at all of those that I have received in the past, they're in my office as they should be. Um, they're not for my personal gain. Um, so I, I have a problem with setting us up for, for potentially violating that with, with you know, something as inconsequential as a t-shirt from a turkey trot or something. So I wonder if maybe the maker of the motion would reconsider. I just don't wanna go down a path where we are, um, you know, we are saying, sorry, we can't wear this t-shirt um, and we can't accept that mug. Um, it just, it sounds ridiculous. And, yeah. and council member that may require some clarification um, because I, I uh, 
I understand the phrase maybe was gift ban, but I, I understood that in the context of existing law in the city's um, gift ordinance, um, which isn't a total ban. So perhaps, um, I, I don't know if that went back to the mayor or, or where that idea first came from, um, but perhaps we could get some clarification on it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. Mayor, was that you? Yeah, I'd be happy to, to just chime in. Yeah, um, the suggestion was uh, to provide a gift ban and certainly there can be uh, a de minimis exception. I think there's no reason why we couldn't do that. I just know that um, it was not uncommon, particularly around the holidays, uh, for baskets of various things to come in. And I think it's just much easier if all of us are able to say, look, we're just not allowed to take gifts and save everybody the trouble, of, you know, sending the wine and the baskets and those kinds of things. Um, so anyway, but obviously we all are able to receive gifts from friends that's different than uh, what we get uh, as public officials. Yeah, I, I'll be honest, I've never gotten a holiday basket or wine and now I'm offended. <laughs> Well, obviously, I'm going to give you the list of people that give them to me so you can go hit them up. Listen, I, I, as the leader of our city, I'm sure, you know, you are that prominent figure. And so you probably are dealing with this. Um, and maybe this should be exclusive to the position of the mayor, um, because I don't know. And see, from seeing the reaction of some of my council colleagues, it's probably not an issue for them as well, that we are not receiving these types of gifts on an ongoing basis. But what we do receive are some very meaningful um, homemade crafts and just beautiful cards and and sometimes they, they have a bit of a value to them because they're more than just a card um, and so I just don't want to fall trapped to that um, and and decline some of that um, not because I, I want to continue to accept all these gifts that I'm just you know been um, uh, uh, stashing at my office but really because I, I just think, you know, this could be a, a, something, a rule that we violate, but like I said, with, with a t-shirt from a turkey trot. So I'd like for the mayor, maker of the motion to maybe just consider this exclusive to the mayor um, uh, position. Uh, maybe that facilitates this, this issue for, for him. Um, and I don't know what the rest of my colleagues think, but, but based on some of your reactions, maybe I think you might also feel the same way as I do because we probably don't we don't get these gifts I don't receive gifts <laughs> I see council members so I was like with sad eyes <laughs> um so, okay. so I, would you consider if uh, I could just, that? yeah if I maybe I just offer one other thing I you know we've had limitations on gifts in the past at various levels um because there's ambiguity about what the that amount is and so forth and there have been issues, right? It's obviously there haven't been issues with this council, anybody here, but you know, Terry Gregory suffered a felony conviction as a result of it. So there are issues. I just don't want, you know, I recognize that everybody is doing their best to play it up and up and not not take anything we're not allowed to take. Um Absolutely agreed. And I think that as my colleagues and I, I, you know, I'm going to freely speak uh, for some of them now, but you can contest that in your own um, uh, 10 minutes, uh, that that's probably not the case for us. And I just don't want, like I said, I just don't want to fall trapped to, to a rule um, and violate that with the t-shirt. Um, and so I'm hoping that the maker of the motion can reconsider that so that we just don't put something, we're not fixing a problem that does not exist for the majority of the council. Yeah, well, well I have to admit, I've gotten a basket before, Sylvia, I'm so sorry. Sad, but, yeah. but, 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 but that's a different topic. <laughs> uh, what, what I would say, look, I mean, I think this is, I think we're getting into the weeds here. Um, I think there's already, we, we have policies in place that already have restrictions and things of that nature, create some of sorts. I'm personally okay with removing that if if it'll you know buy some support. Uh, I don't think it's a it's a big deal. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean we, right. We, I, I mean I, I think we can include the adherence of our commissioners to the same guidelines that we are um, asked to follow, and I think that's very reasonable. Um, I, I think what what is set up for us is also very reasonable, and I just um, like I said, I don't want some of these things to inconsequential kind of t-shirts and tchotchkes to be a violation yeah. um 
I'm okay with that. Okay. For all. okay. Um, and you know, the, the other thing that I was just going to say is that I'm, I'm really grateful that you're bringing this memo forward and that you've outlined uh, some of these items that I feel like it, some of the key proposals are just really important for all of us. I know that you and I experience the darkening of our skin in um, mailers. Um, we also have gotten... Um, negative campaign flyers, all of us probably have gotten negative campaign flyers, um, which isn't very fun. And, and in the spirit of transparency, I think that um, uh, identifying who is part of that independent expenditure allows for us to have um, uh, uh, greater truths to be told in those flyers when people read them. Um, I know that I definitely was not um, supported by some members of this council in my re-election, um, but I was able to, I'm, I'm not a rich person either, like Councilmember Sparza said, I'm very working class, and I represent an opportunity that most people don't have in the city, and that is working class people, to represent working class people um, and others. Um, and I, I uh, the way that I came up is, is, is partly um, due to Councilmember Carrasco, who, you know, we were great friends. We are continue to be great friends even before we were on council, and um, and she uh, uh, told me about a venture to change the rules for our families to benefit our community, and um, you know, told me uh, just painted this great picture about how I was going to impact so socially and social justice and all that. She didn't tell me all the work that was going to come with it, um, but but I'm happy to do it. And that's why we all got reelected, because we're all happy to represent our own districts. Um, and like I said, the, the reason I would support this motion is because we make this makes it possible for the, the people who, like me, wouldn't be able to venture into this arena by no means. Um, and so we, we need to have a diverse, a diverse voices. And so I appreciate you doing this, Council Member Jimenez. Um, and I realize I'm over my, my limit. Thank you. In the spirit of that, we will move on then to um, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, and, and first I was going to agree with Council Member Reynas on the gift issue. I think that was outside the scope of this because, first of all, the the gift ban is not really related to campaign finance, and we're talking about campaign finance. The gift ban, to me, is a separate issue with the conflict of interest, you know, question, which we could discuss. But we already have pretty significant limits on gift bans of fifty dollars. And don't forget the times when you show up at an event and there's finger foods there and you grab something to eat. That's a gift under the the law, and you'd have to report it if you ate more than fifty dollars worth of food. But if you banned it, we wouldn't be able to pick up a a cupcake or something at an event. So. Anyway, I just I'll move on from that. The other item, back to the question of um, item two C one. Um, there was a, a comment made. I think Councilor Jimenez, you, you mentioned the thing about it, it was specific to people who had business in front of the city. I think my concern is how difficult it would be to really make a determination as to um, police that and determine who has business within this twelve months and who will have in the next three months and 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 figuring out who this applies to and who it doesn't, to me, is just you know, so complicated that I, I just really prefer the part two of that, which is if you took that money and the item comes within that period of time, you recuse yourself and that's the rules. That to me is basically in the same spirit of transparency, which is we're being transparent about who's given to us and who we can vote when, when we can vote. We're being transparent in our elections through our campaign filing and the organizations that spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to influence campaigns have to be more transparent in who they're getting their money from and who's influencing our elections. To me, this is really about that transparency and the, comp the complexity of trying to um, figure out who, back to the same thing, who does it apply to, who doesn't it apply to, who can give us money and who can't, and how hard is it going to be for candidates to know who has business before the city when they're asking people to make contributions. It, to me, it's a very difficult Thing and, and, there, and therefore, I mean, while this is, I know, just a, a proposal to study this and bring it back to us later, I, I'd prefer to leave that part out. Um, and I was going to ask about an amendment to leave that part out, but I will, I suppose, in the, in the spirit of studying it, it's okay to leave it in. On the other hand, I don't necessarily want 
in my opinion, our legal staff and others to spend a whole lot of time on an item that I don't think is the right approach. And so I'm torn about whether to, <laughs> to ask for that because you know, there's already a lot here for them to study in terms of trying to figure out what to bring back to the council and it will take time and, and resources for them to do that. So that's sort of, a, I don't know if that's a question for Councilor Jimenez about what you think about my yeah, I, listen, I appreciate that. And I, and I even, even uh, you know, as was asked by Councilmember Mayhan earlier about maybe finding a, another word that's maybe more uh, broadly applicable rather than corporations, even that, right? Um, I guess what I fall back on is, um, as it relates to your comment and his comment, just simply that I take comfort in the fact that the staff's going to go back and work on this, and this isn't the last bite at the apple we're going to have. Um, I would hope, and maybe Nora can speak to this, but assuming we're not prescriptive as at this meeting, this moment saying X corporations and put entity in there or take out C1 specific, trying to be as neutral as I could uh, in, in submitting this proposal. And so I, I would like to sort of uh, gauge whether folks are willing um, to allow the city attorney's office staff to go back and Take a look at this and then bring it back and then you know at that point we can have that conversation about you know being more explicit or narrowing the focus or broadening the focus whatever it may be and i um, guess nora and then maybe any of the other folks that want to chime in okay um thank you council member um i think that our understanding of um the memo is that there are there are specific items in here, but there's also been some council discussion. And so the, the spirit of the effort is to um, focus on the ideas in your memo, but it also sounded like um, we should go forth and, and sounded like um, we should go forth and, and look at what some other cities are doing um, and, and see if there are some ideas out there that um, might interest the council within the confines of the general um, uh, items in this memo. And so we um, would be doing that and bringing back some options and um, advice on options um, and language and those kinds of things um, for, for the council to review. Yes, so, so given that, I mean, I, I, if we can, you know, essentially uh, Council Member Cohen and Mayhan, if we can give staff time to work and, and bring some of that back, I, I, I'd, I'd be more comfortable with that rather than, because I'm trying to think of the implications of what you all are asking, right? Right here on the day is <laughs> trying to figure that out, texting my team, what would it do if we, you know, this or that? And so um, I'd much prefer to have more time, have staff bring something back and, and, and spend more time evaluating this and figuring out if we're going down the right path. So, so I'll decline the... the, the uh, I appreciate that. I'm I'm okay with that because we know we're going to be. This, we're not putting in place an ordinance and, and approving anything tonight. And I guess many of us are telegraphing where we'd go if some of these things came back in a way that that might limit some of the things that we don't want to limit. So that'll help in terms of crafting the policy that comes back. And um, I think I've made my point about what I where I stand on this particular issue. So I, I, that's that's fine with me. I'll go ahead and support support the motion. Thank you. Councilmember Sparza. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be quick. Um, thank you to Councilmember Arenas for bringing up the clarification around the gift ban. Um, I, I actually like the idea of broadening that, uh, but I, um, I, I thought that applied to employees. Do do commissioners like planning commissioners? Don't they already have that? Doesn't that already apply to them? I think that it. I think it does. I think that the mayor had had uh, suggested um, that idea, and so we'll go back and and uh, look at whether or not there are folks that uh, aren't encompassed by that and should be, um, and whether it's a a complete ban or if it's an application of um, uh, the city's rules and, and state law that might not apply to them, but we want to apply to certain um, people. 
Yeah, I, I actually found that to be helpful if there were any commissioners that, uh, particularly the planning commission, because of the, the important you know role that they play. Yeah. Uh, let's be real, there's a lot of money at stake in what they do. Um, and so I thought that was a really good um, suggestion. I'm, I'm also a supporter of, of sticking to the $50 limit for two reasons. One is I think um, we have a tendency to create our own rules, which leads to a lot of confusion um, and complications around what's San Jose, what's the state, and um, and it adds a lot of staff time and a lot of um, candidate and staff confusion around that. And so that's one. And then the other reason is, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I, look, I've never gotten a gift basket, so um, I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> follow up with council member Jimenez later um, but uh but you know we do get homemade goods we get some beautiful homemade things and cards um folks from schools make things for us um and that's part of you know this is a personal job and um we develop very close relationships and go out into our communities and the, the dollar value is very nominal, but there's a lot of heart that goes into those gifts. And, um, and I don't relish being in the position of telling a kindergarten class, no, I can't accept this, you know, frame that you guys have, this picture frame that you've decorated, um, you know, and given to me that has a really cool drawing that one of you has made in the picture frame, you know, things like that, that, that mean a lot. And, um, but again, nobody's buying my vote with, with, you know, beautiful homemade picture frames. Nobody's buying our votes with that, you know, I mean, they're just, they're not. And um, it's really about community at the end of the day. And, um, and so it just, it, 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 it creates more of a barrier than I think um, there needs to be between us and the community. And so I support keeping that, that limit, absolutely. Um, I think most of the things that fall into that category are well, well below the $50 limit. So, um, so that's something I support and thank you for um, bringing that up. That's it for me. Thank you, Councilmember Mayon. Thanks, Mayor. And I, I agree with Councilmember Sparza's comments on gifts. That makes sense to me. Uh, Councilmember Jimenez, just want to go back to the friendly amendment for a moment. And I'm just trying to understand what do we, um, what, what in your opinion do we lose by, by broadening it out? What I thought I heard you describe was wanting to start broad and explore all of our options, learn as much as we can, and then decide what to cut or narrow later. So I, I'm just, I don't understand how that's how that fits on, on item 2C and the, the amendment around just making that broader, such as entities, um, what, what do we lose by going broader? So, so I guess the thing that I don't fully understand, and I think council member Esparza touched on it, is, is that there, there's, there's broad opinion in the community, especially, and I would suspect some, even among some of us, is that contributions, say, from corporations or from a union is a little different, right? And so that I don't, I'm not, I'm not, not open to changing corporations, taking it out of there. I just, I just don't want to be as prescriptive now at this moment uh, to allow the conversation to move forward. That way, staff can do the work, and then we can evaluate it then. Right. Well, I agree on not being prescriptive, which is why I think we should not be prescriptive, and we should just use a neutral term. I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is there are a lot of different entities. I, I'm not even necessarily talking about unions, and I think to to the point about unions, I mean, I think there's a lot of variance there. I think there's, you know, I, I don't, you know, not to pick on the POA, but I, I don't think any of their members are making $20 an hour. And so I, you know, I think there's a lot of variability. Um, I also think you've got trade associations, C4, C5, C6, a lot under the IRS code that is not strictly a corporation. So, I mean, I guess the other question might be for Nora, which is just how do you interpret to uh sorry i'm back to the memo here to c so corporation is that c corps s corps publicly traded corps llc's trade associations chambers of commerce where do you where are we drawing the line on what we're going to actually do research and have a conversation about it seems to me it should be all the entities that spend a lot of money in local politics <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
good it's a good question and that's part of what we would be going back and looking at just what does corporations mean and 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 i'm taking notes as we're going but i'm thinking to myself as this discussion goes on we're going to have to go back to the transcript to to see because i there has been an indication that uh, of an openness to um to broadening that um, or to considering um, maybe best practices that our office um, might be bringing back. And, and I understand in this area, one community's best practices may not be in other communities, but at least uh, those ideas we would be looking at and, and uh, be bringing back uh, to the council so that you would have um, uh, some sense of whether or not the word corporations is an issue and some sense of whether or not um, other communities are looking at ways of, of um, identifying just what um, corporations are and what other um, entities may be and if in and uh, what they're doing with those groups that may be putting a lot of money into campaigns. Okay, well, good. I'm, it sounds like you're interpreting that broadly. I mean. I picked on the POA and its members and didn't, you know, didn't mean to necessarily single them out, but you could also take, you know, SVLG is a trade association, not a corporation. SVO is mm -hmm. a chamber, not a corporation. So I just, it seems like we're defining this very, very narrowly. And I don't think that's the intent, but I don't know why we're stuck on staying so, I, so narrow. So I would say, uh, Council Member Mahan, I, I think you made some good points. And so I, I'm okay with just putting, I guess, having staff incl include the word entity, and then we, we're going to bring it back and we can have a fuller discussion then. I'm okay with that as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it, it could be corporations and other entities, right? I don't, I'm not trying to eliminate corporations. I just want to make sure it's inclusive. And, and to be honest with you, I mean, it's going to give me some time to go back and I'm sure everyone else, including yourself, to go back and work through this a little bit more as it relates to how it, you know, because I'm concerned as to how, how it impacts different entities, corporations right. or otherwise differently, right? Right. Because there are potentially different impacts. And so, I'd like to better understand that. So I think I'm okay with going with entity and then we can we can have that conversation at that point when it comes back. Great, sounds good, thank you. All right, other questions or comments? Okay, uh, let's vote then on the motion with Council Member Menes. Menes? Aye. Prowlis? Aye. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Crosco? Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Thank you. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to Crosco? Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so, forgive me, I was. Uh, uh, I was off the screen, um, and I don't know whether 3.7 was called or not. Was it, Vice Mayor? Yes. It was. Wonderful. Okay. So that should conclude um, our business today. Again, thank you, Professor uh, Hassan. Thank you, everybody, for, uh, for your work. Let's go to open forum now. If members of the community would like to speak. Uh, Tessa Woodman, see? Yes. Okay. We're at open forum. Great. All right. I guess we didn't have our historic vote. I don't know what happened with that. We're supposed to have that on the agenda on in our neighborhood, the, you know, the Sheely neighborhood. But anyway, so getting back to the most important thing um, that is on our agenda today, that the news that came across from uh, our esteemed um, uh, Secretary, Secretary General of the United Nations, we are seeing, uh, um, and Antonio Guterra said, uh, we are seeing indeed that we live in a triple crisis, a climate crisis, a biodiversity crisis, and a pollution crisis. And if we don't act immediately, we are, as I said, on the verge of the abyss. There is no time to lose. So what, what I'm looking at in my neighborhood is make the garden Alameda a garden again. And that is where we have to fight in all of our decisions, um, capitalism and consumerism. And we have to start, you know, and it's just like um, Hank Paulson said, government has to be the change, but the politicians can't do it because it's their jobs. 
that are in their way. And they, you know, that's their roof over their house and their, their food in their belly. And so they can't be making uh, just decisions for the people because they have vested interest, all of them. So we really need to look at the science, like everybody's saying. But what it has to look at is the, the G greenhouse gases that are happening in any project that we're proposing. We have to look at the greenhouse gases and then make the decision on it. And then that's when we start listening to the science and not the politicians, not politics as usual. We have to start you know, dealing with that. We have to act immediately. We are, as, as he said, on the verge of the abyss. There is no time to lose. So that's where we have to start making choices based on our greenhouse gases. We shouldn't be having hotels. We should at least be having housing. And if not that, a community garden to grow food. Thank you. Uh, Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. I was at the County Board of Supervisors meeting today. So um, I'm here now. Uh, thanks for your uh, campaign political reform work. Uh, good luck on, the, on that issue. Um, about the historic preservation in the Shell area, is in the Stockton area, uh, I hope that can be an effort, a cooperative effort of all sides of the community involving uh, the East Side ideas a lot. Um, I hope that, um, what's another issue? Oh, that um, the last night there was the, um, uh, uh, what's it called? The charter review process. And it sounds like you're getting, starting to get more involved into the uh, strong mayor ideas of it now in the next few weeks and months. Um, good luck. I, I'm still much more believing that uh, we're kind of at an end of the strong mayor being uh, in charge of development programs and uh, development developer issues. I think there should be a real focus on uh, refinement of the city charter to allow the mayor certain rules that he possibly didn't really ever have before that we can narrow down now and just from that continue to give the authority to the city council and community and ask them how to address the city manager in the future and uh, make that a make that a, a majority vote process and not give a bunch of power to the mayor. Uh, I hope we can keep that process mellow in our in our decision making in the next uh, thinking in the next few weeks and months. And finally, uh, you know, at, at the Board of Supervisors meeting today, there was a lot of COVID issues. And it'd be interesting if you know, with the events of January 6 and with all the COVID scare and the vaccination process, I hope uh, city government and county government can really make a good effort to explain exactly what the vaccination process is to the community and that process can grow and we can be open and good. Thank you. Thank you. The person with the phone number ending 9427. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thanks. All right, great. My name is Joshua Harrell, and I am a citizen of San Jose. I am a student studying mathematics at San Jose City College, and I will be studying biomedical engineering at San Jose State University this fall. I am also homeless because of the persistent failure of the city of San Jose to approve affordable housing construction. Over the last few months, I have been harassed threatened, assaulted, and suffered hundreds of dollars worth of property damage, all from other residents at homeless shelters. The condition of homelessness is hardly compatible with the American dream of working and studying hard to improve your place in life. The cause of homelessness has to do with the economics of supply and demand. Sonia Herrera, writing for San, San Jose Spotlight on February 8, 2021, tells us that 94% of San Jose's residential land is zoned single family only. There is no way that there will ever be sufficient housing for all the people when on 94% of San Jose's residential land, it is illegal to even build a duplex. The city of San Jose should follow in the steps of Berkeley and legalize multifamily homes on all residential lots citywide, thus restoring the American dream of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Huad Hyder. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I wanted to echo the sentiments of the previous speaker uh, in saying that here in District 1, uh, only a couple blocks from my home, there was an unhoused resident who was residing on the sidewalk near a Carl's Jr. and Green Burrito for maybe six, seven, or eight months. Um, I think sustaining off of just uh, donations from neighbors and um, materials and blankets and so on from people in the nearby community. But it should go without saying that despite what the city is trying to do and the emergency response that it's been trying to coordinate, that these measures are not necessarily enough. Um, that community member in my neighborhood here in District 1 um, passed away uh, in the last two weeks and uh, roses and um, photographs and candles have been placed there. Um, and it's heartbreaking that this is happening in such a wealthy and well-endowed city like San Jose. And we take pride in being um, such an innovative city and such a hotbed of innovation and other things. Um, so I just wanted to share that story. And finally, I wanted to go back to the previous agenda item that was spoken, if that's allowed, Mayor Licardo, for a brief comment. Uh, not typically, no. It, it's about items not on the agenda. Okay, got it. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pacero de San Fernando. Oh, this is Roland. I thought that was changed, but never mind. <laughs> okay. Well, so I want to... I want, I want to talk to you a little bit about Paseo de San Fernando and explain to you exactly what it is that you're, look, you're looking at. This is a station in the Netherlands called Bilmer, B-I-J-L-M-E-R. -E and the reason I'm bringing this to your attention, it was the only station that made any sense on the trip that, that made to Holland. But you blasted to that station at 100 miles an hour. That station is seven miles from uh, Amsterdam, where you bo boarded the train, and you went to that station on your way to Utrecht. And the reason nobody told you about that station is that the people who were on board with you on the train were Bantam Coral. And this station that you're looking at were designed by Grimshaw, the same architect as the people who designed London Bridge. And that is another form of not direct campaign contribution, but when Spur and the Knight Foundation take you on a trip, they're essentially biased. They're essentially lobbying on somebody else's behalf. And this is how we ended up with all these contracts. And now we're looking at $15 million worth of, of a, you know, disc or whatever contracts in, 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 at Diridon that are giving us all this, you know, discomfort with Google and everything else. And that is something I think at some point has to be part of the conversation when you start about campaign contributions. It's this kind of trip that basically ultimately influences uh, decisions of our elected officials. And I will include what happened to the Bob downtown station and the, and the trip to Barcelona. That was directly as a result of manipulations by HNTB and Parsons Brinkerhoff. And now we're back to campaign contributions. So that has to be part of the conversation moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Uh, person with the phone number 5140. Mr. Sancini, your device appears to be muted. There it is. Yeah, this Zoom works really well. Hey, you know who I am, Sam? I'm glad you know. You know, I've, I've been practicing decorum. You know, I've told a lot of people about the decorum that you were talking about, and everybody laughed. They thought it was hilarious about me having decorum. So I'm trying my best to have, like, an NPR approach now to these meetings. So I find it probably more irritating than my usual decorum. But I have also a hard time believing about this campaign financing. You guys take money all the time. You know you do. You know it's in secret in a, in a, in a, in a brown paper bag or an envelope. You know you guys take it. Then we got to hear this sad story about, oh, what if the kindergarten class makes me a piece of pottery that's near and dear to my heart? Oh, come on. Come on. You guys are going to talk to me about that kind of stuff? 
you know, last night I'm listening to the marijuana tax issue. You guys are taking money. The city takes money in for marijuana. That's against federal law. So what? who's, who's to say you guys aren't going to break the campaign finance rules? The cannabis tax and everything. You guys are, you guys, you know, Perales rubs his hands together at the meetings. I've seen him do it about getting this marijuana tax. So don't tell me how you guys are so holier than now and thou and, you know, not taking money from uh, campaign contributions. But at the same time, you take this money, in my mind, illegally, by the way, against the federal government, through the police department, San Jose PD, the biggest gang in, in this whole town armed they take everybody else's drugs and guns away and use it for themselves so they can get the tax on the marijuana i mean if you get busted for a pot do they ask you for a receipt now if you don't have the receipt you get you you get the citation or whatever throw you in jail or uh mr soto uh yes uh thank you mayor i wanted to wait uh, for this moment when uh the whole council was together. Um, I wanted to apologize to the council and to, and to you, Mayor, for uh, my loss of composure um, last week. And uh, I know better. And uh, I, I won't make any excuse for myself other than to acknowledge that, uh, that I do have a responsibility to conduct myself a certain way, despite how uh, I may be feeling or experiencing something that's, that's going on with me. So I just want to extend that to the council. This is from Eugene Debs. Uh, he actually did uh, five years in prison. He got locked up for this particular speech. Here's an excerpt of, of it. Give me a hundred capitalists and let me ask them a dozen simple questions about the history of their own country. And I will prove to you that they are ignorant and unlettered as any of you may find in the so-called lower classes. They know little of history. They are strangers to science and they are ignorant of sociology and blind to the art but they know how to exploit, how to gouge, how to rob, do it with legal sanction. They always proceed legally for the reason that the class which has the power to rob upon a large scale has the power to control the government and legalize their robbery. That is the purest definition that I could find for redlining. And that's why it's so critically important. What my concern is, is really the what we are normalizing in our city right now at this particular time, we know the racist policies that created the generational, uh, the generational social and economic issues. We know that it infected the criminal justice system. We know that it created the prison to uh, the school to prison pipeline. So, with that said, if that is in the common knowledge, and there isn't a moral or ethical stand that the city itself takes. With respect to that, you're actually normalizing that kind of cruelty and that kind of power. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Meetings adjourned.